appreciate that a lot. So we want to clap for ourselves all the time, Jim. That's a very good uh, <laughs> change. By the way, we are streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. And I should say, just to tease ahead a little bit, I'm about 10 feet away from this beautiful harpsichord. Yes. And a septet of players from the great Handel and Haydn Society are going to be playing for us and you and the people at the library live in a little bit more than an hour. So really stick around. But first, the numbers are up, even though deaths and hospitalizations are down in most, most of the country. But Dr. Anthony Fauci says we're past it, then he walked it back a bit the next day. We are certainly right now in this country out of the pandemic phase. So when I said phase, I probably should have said the acute stage of the pandemic. Joining us now to help us make sense where we actually are is Kath, uh, Dr. Catherine Gergen Barnett, back for Ask the Doctor. Dr. Gergen Barnett is the Vice Chair of Primary Care Innovation and Transformation and Residency Director in the Department of Family Medicine at Boston Medical Center and BU Medical School. If you have a question, you can call her or text her. It's a one week anniversary of texting on this show, Marjorie. Very exciting. Great time. moment. 877 301 8970. You can make Marjorie happy if you want to email at bprwgbh.org or tweet us at BOS Public Radio. Doctor, it's great to see you. It's so wonderful to be here, and thank you all also who are here live. Yes, thank you very much, Doctor, for coming in today. So, as Jim just said, you can call the doctor, you can reach her uh, by phone, 877-301-8970. Same number for texting, 877-301-8970. Or you can call her, uh, or you can text, um, excuse me, you can email with her questions, bprwgbh.org, or tweet us at boss. Uh, public radio. So let, let's start out with what uh, Dr. Fauci just said. You know, w we do seem to feel like we're in a different phase. Some people still yeah. have masks on, lots of people don't anymore. Things have changed. Where, yeah. are, where are we? Yeah, so it was, um, I think, the, the unfortunate phraseology of Tuesday with Dr. Fauci um, and, and really kind of creating this uh, messaging of perhaps we're out of the pandemic. In fact, I got a slurry of, of news calls that afternoon saying, can you comment on us being out of the pandemic? And then uh, the next day, his, his quote was, well, we're out of the full-blown explosive pandemic phase. Um, and we're decelerating, which I actually think is uh, far more accurate. And, and um, you know, nothing about where we have been has been very black and white, as everybody here is very aware. Um, we are reaching an unfortunate um, uh, kind of death toll. We're anticipating by May 21st, a million Americans will have died um, from COVID-19. Um, and so while we are very anxious to look at the horizon, I think we need to be uh, take a moment to mark where we have been. Um, and then as Jim has suggested, we are also seeing mixed data on um, where we are right now about infection. So we know that just yesterday in Massachusetts, there were 3,000 new cases that were reported. We know we are back up to about a 5% positivity rate. Um, the whole wastewater, you know, do we track it? Do we not track it? Some people are saying, well, a lot of people are out of town, so maybe we can't track the wastewater because they were going to the bathroom somewhere else and <laughs> then they came back. Um, and so, you know, just after a kind of a dip in it, we're, we're now seeing a, a slight rise again in wastewater data. You know, all that being said is, what does this mean? Are we actually tracking the cases? Or are we tracking the impact? Um, and I think part of what Dr. Fauci is indicating and part of what we need to be doing as public health messengers and as you know, uh, citizens is to be thinking about, okay, so at some point we know that already 60% of Americans have been calculated to have COVID-19 at some point. 75% of youth have yeah. had COVID-19, which you know, really since December, um, uh, and, and I know that that was a huge uptick with the Omicron we know that uh, those rates are going to continue. Um, we're gonna continue to see people we know or even ourselves be infected. But are you going to the hospital? Are you going to die, right? And Can so, I, go yeah. ahead. so I, I, really I, looking at those data know, points. I don't really give a damn about the numbers. I know yeah. I'm not a doctor, an epidemiologist. You just touched on what matters yeah, to me. Exactly. You don't go to the hospital, you don't die. I'm not suggesting we wouldn't like to minimize the number of infections, but the numbers are so phony, doctor, anyway. I do a home test almost every day. Marjorie thinks- You do? Well, I shouldn't have admitted that to you. 
He I also, <laughs> we've talked about he wants a booster every week. I so, didn't, well, I I didn't know you did a levitation. Yeah. I've also had about 100 MRIs in my life. You know what? You know what? Maybe you should do two a You're day. You're part okay, of the health care spend problem. By yeah. the way, some days I do do two a day. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for asking. Well, there's yeah. a little love of the action. Why not Can do I a make my test? point? Yes, Thank you very please. much. What was my point? Oh, my point was this, that the numbers are so loosey-goosey uh, I do do a lot of home tests. A mm -hmm. lot of people do a lot of home Absolutely. tests, Marjorie. And uh, who reports them? Nobody. That's, That's number right. one. Number two, yeah. because people are less nervous about dying, uh, I know a lot of people who don't feel so hot, mm -hmm. and they say, as long as I'm staying home, I'm not even going to test myself. Mm -hmm. So the numbers are so clearly mm -hmm. uh, 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 lower, the reported numbers, than the reality that it seems to me what the public should be focusing on. I know you've got to do something else. The public should be focusing on, are people going to the hospital, are people dying? That's the most important stuff. Am I wrong about that? You are not wrong. I do think, though, that we need to continue to highlight the fact that up to 30% of people who get COVID-19 may develop long COVID. Well, that's a problem. Right? That's a good so point. That is, so, we are, so we can say, you know, ICU, hospitalizations, those are critical to think about healthcare and outcomes of human beings, but we also know uh, there are a lot of things that we don't know about infections down the road. So even if you are saying, okay, everyone's getting COVID and, and I'll stay home and not report it, the fact is, is there, there can be consequences for being loosey-goosey really about the numbers. Well, okay, one last, okay, no, no, one last, one last thing. I have one this. last, too. This thing about <laughs> the six, and by the way, our number is 877-301-8970. A ton of you are texting. Feel free to call if you choose to that number. Uh, uh, we read the numbers that you just recited them. Nationally, roughly 60% of people have had COVID, a little over 50% here in Massachusetts. Yep. As we discussed with our Kaplan the other day, our medical ethicist, that does not mean you have immunity. There are different loads right. that people have. However, a test that I've actually not taken in a few months is an antibody test. Do you advise somebody to buy, I think you have to pay for those, correct me if I'm wrong, do you advise somebody to go get an antibody test to, to determine if you have had COVID, even if you don't know it, or you say it's a waste of money? No, you should not go get an Why? antibody test. First of all, it's just not what we're doing anymore because okay. the antibodies can uh, wane. We also know that getting an antibody doesn't really indicate what you should be doing in terms okay. of healthcare measures moving forward. Fair enough. You know, I, I have a question about uh, long haul COVID. You mentioned that up to 30% of people can wind up with long <coughs> Hall COVID, yeah. but I've read different things that some people uh, got COVID, got a very mild case, mm -hmm. but kept on with this sort of mild case where they were tired all the time, or that they got really sick and then they that was why they got long haul COVID. So does it matter how sick you get? Or yeah, that's such. A, I'm so glad you raised that. Actually. Interestingly, we're seeing a lot of people who are getting long COVID, so those symptoms that last longer than four weeks and can be a panoply of things, can be shortness of breath, can be fatigue, and you know, lots of things, um, didn't necessarily have a very severe yeah. case of COVID-19. And so that's the surprising part. Um, so we're not seeing a direct correlation. And, and I think you know, that's part of why we need to continue to message that when you can take precautions. Nobody should try to get COVID-19, first of all. Um, and second of all, recognize that there are potential other downstream consequences of get, getting COVID-19 and being aware that those out, are out there. And the reason why we see 75% of kids that haven't gotten this is what? Well, we really see the rate of rise after Omicron. So December ripped, to February. Yeah, ripped through our community. So we know that <coughs> Omicron, so we're talking about BA1 that we're talking about from January. So I, I just, I think there's a lot that is so hard to keep up with, um, you know, in, and I'm in this profession, um, but thinking about what are, what's Omicron, what's one subvariant, what's the sub subvariant. So we're talking about the initial wave of Omicron that we saw in January is really what got our cases up in terms of transmission being up 30%. It was a more, you know, could, we can pass it more easily to each other. Um, and then on top of that, we now have BA2 and BA2.12, <laughs> uh, which, which are um, now sort of taking over. So we heard in the uh, top of the hour, BA2, um, you know, accounts for majority of cases now. And that's 30% even more transmissible um, than the original Omicron. So 
again, what does this mean? It's not for a scare tactic. It's thinking about the fact is we're not seeing hospitalizations go up, mm -hmm. and so that's great. What we do know about BA2, though, the subvariant of Omicron, is that it can get into the lungs more than the original Omicron. So just being sort of aware of that, those symptoms as well. I just want you to know, before we go to the calls, I resent the fact, Doctor, that you said you were so glad Marjorie asked her question and you did not oh, say Oh, I'm you were so, so glad sorry. I'll Jim. give you some love later. Thank you. Jim. Christina yeah. in a car, <laughs> you are first on Boston Public Radio with Dr. Catherine Gergen Barnett. Welcome to the show, Christina. Hey, thanks. It's good to be here. Thank you. So my question, my question is this. Um, I'd like to know if I have if I have had COVID, and I know that there is a test, but like it's not readily um, um, given. And is it still true that if you donate blood, that they that will show up? And also, like if you have the Christina, test, we got to let you go. We got the first question. The connection is atrocious. Uh, we got the question. Thank you. Does it trans? Would, do, if you give blood, do they test it for whether or so, not you got COVID? So, so there are actually. It's interesting, Christina. You know, one of the ways that we've tracked how many Americans have had COVID nineteen is exactly this. So when um, people get, you know, their sort of public health data samples, um, but we don't track it to the human being and then don't give them feedback. It's mm. not sort of a curated system where you can say, "Hey, gave blood. Now, can you tell me if I had COVID nineteen?" It's more just just um, sort of packaging it in terms of public health information. Christina, thanks for the call. I'm sorry I had to cut you off, but the connection was horrible. You know, the question I think on the, the minds of most parents of young kids is are we finally about to see <laughs> yeah. approval of a vaccine for under sixes? And a corollary question, if I can combine the Virginia text and says, the globe indicates that there might not be enough interest for the young child and infant vaccinations. However, mothers of infants can't go to the supermarket, their doctor's office, they can't work due to the risk, et cetera. So if you can address both, what's the timetable on the under six? And are we all, what's the deal if you've got an infant, a really young kid? Absolutely. So um, we've all been waiting with bated breath. And as we have heard, Moderna just yesterday announced that they would go to the FDA with some of their data um, for the vaccine for children six months to five years of age. Um, the initial data, it doesn't sound nearly as kind of wowzers as some of what we we're looking at for adult vaccine, um, but it does show that for children six months to two years, it could protect kids uh, up to 51% from, from symptomatic and 37% for two to five years of age. I do want to give a, a massive um, kind of contextualization around this data. So this data was um, curated during Omicron. Right? So Omicron, as we know, is one of the most contagious variants we've seen. Um, and so we really need to remember this is not the original variant. Um, and so that data is actually pretty good um, for kids. What we do know is there has been a lot of talk around Pfizer having also kind of um, put together a um, set of vaccines that they're very excited about. They're looking at a three-dose um, regimen for children, um, and, and Moderna is looking for a two-dose. It looks like Moderna is slightly ahead in terms of putting their data forth. The big question, I think, on people's mind is, are, is the FDA going to wait to have data both from Pfizer and Moderna to move forward? Um, they are very clear that if Moderna comes forth and they're really, they have good data, they're not going to wait. Um, they know that this is important. The big question that I have is given how low our vaccination uptake has been for five to 11 year olds, is how much are we then going to that's have um, uptake in these groups? Um, and, and that's really, you know, kind of critical. And then to move to your very good question, Jim. Wasn't mine, was Virginia. Uh, okay, Virginia. But thank you. Um, about, about infants and, and parents of infants, because as we just also heard in the top of the hour, we know that childcare is extraordinarily expensive. We know that people can't go back to work. Uh, we know that the, the gray zone is huge right now in schools in terms of what they're willing to take in terms of a child who may have the sniffles. Um, we do know that for young infants, moms, when they're pregnant, if they get their COVID vaccines and their boosters, they're protecting 
their infants and they're actually giving them some um, antibodies. Um, and then other than that, it's, it's a really, it's a tough time. What's you the know, time, I'm sorry, and if you had a guess, yeah. what's an FDA approval. or an EU uh, emergency yeah. use authorization So, approval? you know, ideally, so we're, we're at the end of April now, where if we could move forward in, in May, that would be great, although there's some talk that it probably won't be until June. Okay. You know, two quick things. I, I wonder if part of the reason that this huge increase of children 5 to 11, up to 75% yeah. from December to February was what you just mentioned, yeah. that so few of them are vaccinated. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And the second thing is, um, a couple of people are, are mentioning how the, the at-home tests cannot really uh, often measure a positive result for yeah. several days. You may feel lousy on Monday, yeah. but you, you're negative, and you're yeah. negative on Tuesday, you're negative on Wednesday. That kind of defeats the purpose of the at-home test in terms of getting the antiviral medication, yeah. right? Because if you don't know, you, yeah. if you don't test positive until the fifth or sixth day, yeah. you're too late to get the, the antiviral. So should you get a PCR test? Or? Yeah, so um, for those who are at risk, so right now we're, we're talking about, you know, primarily I'll say Paxlovid, right, as an oral antiviral. And we know that it's um, given within the first five days. Um, and it can reduce, uh, you know, kind of uh, getting very sick by 88%. So great outcome data, although I've heard it taste quite awful. Oh. Um, but you can suck on peppermints and ginger and <laughs> um, apparently takes the taste away. Um, that being said, for if you are high risk, so um, if you're feeling unwell and you're high risk and your at-home test is negative and you have reason to believe that maybe you actually do have COVID-19, I think a PCR test is a good idea. Um, the whole kind of um, you know, getting a home test every single day for many days, I think that's that's challenging. I think that unless you're Jim and Thank you do you. it every day. <laughs> um, but but it's, you know, it's, it's untenable. I think people want to know that answer. But unfortunately, that's where we are right now with the BA2. We know that you may not be positive on that first test. If you do not feel well, mask and go about the way, you know, go, go about your day so that you're actually not going to be exposing people. Jim, a texter just pointed out that the, one of the reasons you text, you test every day yeah. is because you like the, the Q-tip part of the whole experience. No, that's for, if you're not a long time listener, you don't know about our discussions about the erotic nature of the Q-tip experience and we'll leave it at that. Wow. Well, All right. I'm, I'm sad I just I joined two years up. ago. My friend did here. Exactly. You missed and it. Clearly. <laughs> Lowey and Holden, you're next on Boston Public Radio with Dr. Catherine Gergen Barnett. Welcome, Lowey. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, maybe you just have answered part of my question, but I just got on Tuesday the IV um, Beb Kevl Lava Lava, whatever it is. <laughs> That's how I feel. Yeah. For, um, for COVID, I, I was eligible for that. And. Um, they never told us, the, the end of my quarantine, they said, was today, and if I felt better tomorrow, I could go out, which I'm not going to do. I'm going to be very, very cautious what I do. But they never said, do, do I need to test again before I go out, or how do I know that I'm not going to be giving it to people? I certainly will wear a mask, but I just wondered if you could help me with that. Should I test again, or won't, will, will I get a... False positive, false negative. Thank you very much. Lowy, thanks for the call. We appreciate it. Thank you, Lowy. Well, you still sound, you know, never having met you, but you still sound like you have symptoms. So um, I hope you recover completely quickly. So, um, you know, this whole, I think, you know, the again, the five days um, kind of isolating after you get COVID-19, and then what do you do after that? Um, certainly, we do not recommend people to get a PCR test. So PCR tests can stay positive for weeks after you've had COVID-19. So do not go back and get another uh, PCR test. Um, you know, people uh, are, are kind of plus or minus about whether you need to test at five days. Um, their CDC has recommended that if you are feeling completely well and you want to do a home test and it's negative, um, you should go out, but you can still need to wear a mask, as you said, Lowy, and, and, and sort of take precautions. Um, honestly, given the fact that it sounds like you still have symptoms, I would continue to isolate and then when you are feeling better. We do not recommend anyone leave without when they still have symptoms for at least 24 hours. Um, but when you are feeling 
completely better for 24 hours. Um, if you would like to, for reassurance, take a home test um, and, and still, for the course of 10 days, uh, not be in contact with anyone. You know, an immunocompromised texter wants to know if it's okay to see friends indoors or eat in restaurants yet, or as this person put it, or are we in just as much danger of dying as before, or could we get Paxlovid if we get it? Yeah, so um, great question. So uh, first of all, if you're immunocompromised, you are eligible for that second booster. Um, so Moderna and Pfizer have both put forth a second booster uh, that you can get if you're greater than 50 years of age or if you have any sort of um, um, immunocompromised status and, and it's been greater than four months. So uh, I would definitely recommend that for the person who just texted or called. Um, and then uh, if you have been vaccinated and you are boosted, um, and in this case, double boosted, um, and you um, are with people who you know, know to be negative, they've home tested maybe, uh, and without any other clear kind of exposure, um, you should know that even if you get COVID-19, your risk of be getting very sick or being hospitalized goes way down because you took care of yourself and got vaccinated and boosted. Um, and so we can't, you know, COVID-19 is not gonna leave us. Um, and we cannot live our life not seeing people we love, um, but we have to continue to think about what are our risk factors and, and also, you know, is a risk factor to be lonely. And so one, people have to see people they love too um, and recognize they're doing everything they can to protect themselves from getting very, very sick. We're talking with Boston Medical Center's Dr. Katherine Gergen Barnett for another uh, Ask the Doctor segment. We're gonna keep talking to her after this quick break. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. Support for our programs comes from you and Standish Village in Dorchester's Lower Mills, providing assisted living residents with programs designed to help seniors stay sharp, social, and independent. Learn more at standishvillage.com programs. And McLean Middleton, a regional law firm with over 100 attorneys and locations in Woburn and Boston, serving clients for over 100 years in the areas of corporate law, tax law, litigation, and estate planning. McLean.com. And New England Dental Group, committed to helping you stop hiding your smile by offering a variety of dental implant solutions to replace missing teeth in one of their seven locations. Learn more at newenglanddentalgroup.com. And Ocean State Job Lot, partnering with customers to provide Ukrainian refugees with medical supplies, health and hygiene products, food, and clothing. Learn more at oceanstatejoblot.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marge Regan. We're live at the Boston Public Library. Yet again, streaming on YouTube.com slash GBH News. If you're just joining us, we're talking to Dr. Catherine Gergen Barnett. She's with us for Ask the Doctor, where she's answering all questions COVID-related at 877-301-8970 for both calling and texting. You know, uh, before we get back to COVID, uh, Dr. Catherine Gergen Barnett is multi-talented here. She's a physician. She's talking to us right now, and she also wrote a great piece for the Boston Globe about the crisis in primary care. And this is this is so important. What'd you say? Uh, well, I so I, I'm very I feel very blessed to to work as a family medicine doctor at Boston Medical Center, um, and I've been there you know 16 years, um, and really seeing things through the front lines of, of primary care, and recognizing um, as somebody who has been sort of not only on the front lines but also involved in the leadership of primary care that we are really at a crisis point where we're having colleagues leaving primary care, left and right. They are, uh, we've heard about burnout, certainly that is a part of it, um, and now burnout is up to 71% in primary care. Um, but we also know that the burden of responsibility um, has gone up. We know that primary care clinicians have had to um, work on so many different fronts in terms of keeping people safe from COVID, answering questions around that, taking care of chronic disease that has gone um, um, un, unkept uh, for, for two years, um, the mental health kind of trauma that we're in right now. And, and without a lot of resources. So primary care 
positions see greater than 50% of the population, and we have less than 50% of funding. We get six cents per dollar in healthcare spending. Um, and we and we get far less than than any other kind of develop quote you know quote unquote developed country um, than than um, and and so how do we kind of tip the scales back to understand how do we invest in things that keep us well right and and my my friend and colleague actually gave a great quote and he said you know primary care is a little bit like oxygen you don't know how much you need it until it's yeah. until you're you're losing it right and so. My, it was, I wrote it actually, I co-authored it uh, with the chair of family medicine at Tufts, uh, Dr. Wayne Altman, um, and, and our point was really that we need to, um, first of all, citizens be more aware that this is happening, right? Because if one day you wake up and you just can't find a primary care doctor, that's a real thing. Which is um, common. I which is already common. Which is already common. It's already difficult. It will become more difficult. Um, and then the second thing is as policymakers and as states people, um, where do we invest our medical dollars, right? Um, and how can we put money back into the pockets um, of, of community health centers that are doing this good, important work? Um, and so, you know, th this, is, this is a much more kind of multi-dimensional picture, um, but it's really important to dialogue about. We don't have time to get into it today, but we've discussed it with the governor, and I think the governor's back with us on the 26th. We'll discuss it with him again. His major yeah. health initiative yeah. in his final few months is to right. mandate that a certain level of spending on both right. behavioral health and primary care yeah. happen, which would help with the problem. Let's go to Lori in South Boston. You are next on Boston Public Radio with Dr. Catherine Gergen Barnett. Let's go to Lori. Thank you so Oops. thank you so much for taking my call. Hi, Lori. Um, I want hi. I wanted to know. Um, I have had three Pfizer vaccines, and I have an appointment for my fourth for the second booster. But I read somewhere that it would be smart to switch to Moderna. Um, should I continue with Pfizer all the way, or should I take Moderna this time? Thanks, Lori. Lori, thank you, and thanks for um, uh, staying so on top of your vaccines and boosters. So really, um, the the difference between Moderna and Pfizer is very slim. Um, if you know, it, they're both uh, use the same technology, the messenger RNA technology. Um, and if you have an appointment for the Pfizer, I would just keep that appointment, um, and there's no need to switch. By the way, I want you to know, I waited at least, Marjorie knows this, a full hour after the authorization until I got my second booster. <laughs> so I was trying to show some self-restraint. I'm pretty, so proud of you. I felt pretty good about that. Lori, thank you for your call. Where are we going next, uh, friends? Uh, we'll, well go me, somewhere next. Well, meanwhile, I, I, how often do you, people are asking about events they've got coming up, particularly one yeah. person just called about a, a, about a wedding. How long would the at-home test after COVID, would you normally test positive. You said with the PCR, it could be for a very long time. And one particular person worries about going to a family event in the Bahamas. You can't get in with a positive test. So the rapid um, at-home test we see uh, usually becomes negative by 10 to 11 days okay. maximum. Okay. Um, and so, and if it's still positive, it means you're actually still actively shedding virus. So um, that's an important um, thing to note. Um, so, so follow that positive test again, you know, only if you need to do another one at 10 or 11 days. But, um, but the PCR test, like we said, it, it, you know, picks up old dead virus that it has no meaning. You know, okay. uh, we're almost out of time, Doctor. Can you give us some parting thoughts for people who are still anxious, which I think is practically yeah. everybody to some degree. Yeah. I mean, on whatever, I don't even know what day this is, April, whatever it is. Uh, how should you be living your, your life? Not, you know, I, I'm not talking about the outliers, yeah. the immunocompromised, yeah. very old people. It, it, the yeah. average person who has some trepidation, yeah. uh, what do you say to them? Well, first of all, I think that we're needing to continue to recognize that the risks are out there, but that it's all relative risk at mm -hmm. this point. So 
we need to understand what are our risk factors, to your point, um, what are the risk factors of people we're going to be with, um, but then also know that we have so many tools now at our disposal. We know that we have a lot of medications to keep us um, from getting very sick after we have gotten COVID-19. We know, again, we have vaccines, we have boosters. Um, and so, you know, making plans to see people in a smart way, um, I think it's really time for us to be getting back um, to the world. I think everybody feels that way, but not just throwing caution to the wind, remembering what we have learned over these last two years and implementing those things. Can I just add one thing, which I'm sure you'd agree with? I'm looking out at the audience here. You know what I really like? Some people have chosen, for whatever reason, to wear a mask. Yeah. And this whole notion, we've talked about the intimidation people feel in some settings. If you're most comfortable, for whatever your personal reason is, to be wearing a mask in a setting where most people are not, wear the damn mask. I know Absolutely. you agree, but that Completely. is the way to so, go. Completely. So what do you do? If, you, if you're going to a wedding in two weeks, you're sitting at a table at 10, you got the mask on or not? How about if you're going to the White House correspondence? <laughs> <Yeah. career? laughs> or not you're going to the White House You're a 79-year-old president <laughs> yeah. of the United right. States with yeah. 2,500 yeah. people, yeah. super spreader yeah. city. Yeah, but he's going and wearing a mask. And Dr. Is he wearing Fa a mask? Yeah, he's oh, going. Great. Oh, I'm glad and to Dr. Fauci it. has decided not to go because he's 81 or... 83. He's a know. hell of a fit. 81, yeah, by he's, the way. Amazing. he's amazing. Um, but that was his choice. And so, you know, again, I think to your point, Jim, your excellent point is how do we support <laughs> people's autonomy and making sure that we don't shame people? This is not a moral thing. This is just recognizing that this is how do we keep each other and ourselves safe and not bringing judgment into the matter. By the way, that excellent point comment redeemed yourself. Thank, thank you, you so much for being here. <laughs> Doctor, it is great to see you as always. Thank we really you. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very, out. very much for being here. Let's hear it. Dr. Catherine Bergen Barnett is the Vice Chair of Primary Care Innovation and Transformation and Residency Director in the Department of Family Medicine at Boston Medical Center and Boston University Medical Center. Thank you again, Doctor, for coming in. Coming up. Uh, we're going to be keeping the phone on text lines open because we're going to talk to you about sports betting in Massachusetts. Are you already pay placing your bets? Would you consider it once it's officially law? Or are you, as Jim Browdy would say, appalled? <laughs> That's just around the corner. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. time on the world a new film set at the height of the cold war in occupied estonia firebird follows two young men who fall in love on a soviet air force base the movie was shown at a russian film festival but just once we had protesters outside the cinema with banners saying stop homosexual propaganda it lands in u.s theaters this weekend against the backdrop of russia's war in ukraine firebird on the world this afternoon at three here on gbh news 89.7 Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Marjorie and live at the Boston Public Library, streaming live today on youtube.com slash GBH News. If you're not here, I would suggest you think about coming here during lunch, because in about an hour or so, a septet of players from the great, great Handel and Haydn Society are going to play for us, and I am really excited about it, particularly on a beautiful Friday afternoon. So it appears that sports betting is finally coming to Massachusetts. I don't want to get lost in the weeds. The Senate passed their version yesterday. There's some differences for the House. They don't allow betting on college games. They only allow debit cards to be used so you don't put it on your credit card and go broke and that sort of things. Because already, Marjorie said how appalled she thinks I am, and I am, actually. <laughs> Even the people of Massachusetts are huge gamblers already. 
at least when it comes to lottery tickets. People may not know this. We spend more on average, every man, woman, and child in Massachusetts than any other state in the country by a long shot on state-sponsored gambling. Then you had casinos. Then you had that venal Kino thing on your table when you're eating dinner. <laughs> we want to know, you can tell I have a position on this. We want to know yeah. if you're welcoming the news, bidding adieu to your shady sports bookie, or do you think this is just the latest continuation of us become like a Las Vegas kind of culture? Uh, give us a buzz or text us at 877-301-8970. Despite all the drama on Beacon Hill, it's pretty clear to me now that the Senate finally voted. And by the way, we're going to have a Senate president here, I think, May 13th or something. Yep. Do you think they'd have the courage to vote by roll call? No, I don't. Instead of voice vote? I so don't. So your constituent can know if you voted yes or no. No, the answer is they did not do that. Yep. And it's going to happen. They're going to resolve their differences. We're going to have a sports betting. I know all the stuff about how X percent of the sports betting in New Hampshire are people with Massachusetts license plates, and we're giving up money. But is there not a limit? on our perspective about how much, what percentage of the money we raise to uh, pay for cops and firefighters well, you know, and teachers comes yeah. from gambling. It well, is regressive Jim, and think, horrible. Think about the Celtics coming up, you know. They, they're in the playoffs here. I mean, they 4-0 sweep the other night with, with Brooklyn. I mean, a lot of excitement around betting on the Celtics. Marjorie, they could. say we can raise $60 million a year. Do you know what, how the state raises $60 million a year? If people here lose $60 million a year, and the reality is there won't be the same level of gambling on sports if you have to drive across the border. So I don't like it. It is okay. coming. I know that. And I think the notion of only, do you at least agree that only debit cards, you're not. I do think that's a good a idea. I mean, that, that's idea. what the Senate is doing, because obviously you could go into a lot of debt if exactly. you're allowed to bet in your credit card. Uh, with a debit card, you could, of course, wipe out your bank account, but at least it won't be by the thousands and thousands of dollars. So I, I think that's a good idea. And, you know, this piece in the Globe, the editorial about it, <coughs> uh, advocates, this is a uh, compromise, uh, saying that it is a good idea on the debit cards, and it is a good idea not to do uh, local college yeah, gambling. Yeah, that's what most of the states do. They do college, yeah. but they, ex so they you could, exclude So you could bet local. on March Madness, and yeah. you could bet on, on that stuff, but you couldn't bet on, you know, Boston College or something like that. 877-301-8970 for calls and texts. Are you happy that sports betting is probably, I would say, you know, coming to us maybe June, late May, that kind of thing? We do spend a lot of money on the lottery. They, they, they were talking about if... Um, Sports gambling will not be a game changer. Sixty or seventy million dollars annually, versus one billion. A the lottery, lottery. lottery is huge. Generates. It's the most year. quote successful lottery in the country, meaning the most money returned. But as I, re I repeat, not only do we spend more in the lottery than any state by far. Mm -hmm. Do you know who spends the most money on the lottery? I know poor people, people. who can't afford it. And you know what? Happened? It's like Robin Hood in reverse. I, I did a piece for the Globe magazine a few years ago. Yeah. People in Chelsea spend, at that time, an average of, I think, $1,300 a person. A right. person. And you know why they you know do what it? The, whoa, whoa. You know what their average income is in Chelsea? 13000 Okay. 10% of their income. In Weston, that gets money from this fund, they spend like $30. And the average income is a couple hundred because grand. the person in Weston isn't thinking they're going to win and be able to buy a house if they win the lottery. Or they're going to so, be able to get And the state should be dangling that carrot that's no, never going to be eaten? I just think that... It, some people love to play you the lottery. You want to bet on this it gives them, I, I'm not even about. a better, but they it's, it's hopeful. I think that's why people that don't have any money bet, because they, they hope that they're going to win. Yeah, let me tell you something. One, you of, one of my them, favorite Jim, scenes. They're never going to get there at 20 bucks an hour. One of my favorite it. scenes, Marjorie, mm -hmm. is standing in line at a 7-Eleven or yep. something. We have one a couple of blocks from my house. And the older woman who has a couple of uh, uh, order forms for her lottery ticket and is buying cat food, and she doesn't have a cat. So, okay. I mean, it's ridiculous. So Brian, and, yeah. Brian, Brian and Marblehead, you're first on Boston Public Radio. Which side are you on here? Thank you so much. I am going to go against the prude, Jim. Thank you. And have to say that it's kind of shameful it took so long for this to pass when we have DraftKings in Massachusetts. That's, it's founded gambling here, right? Gambling on sports. Yes. That's Draft, a good point. Gambling on sports is not even close to as... Um, bad as Kino and the lottery and scratch tickets and all these things, we should have sports betting. And I'm glad that they finally got their act together last night. Well, Brian, you are going to get your way. It's going to happen. Thank you for the call. And by the way, a texter from a 0832 agrees with Brian. He says, Jim, 
how do you manage to run everybody's life in only 24 hours a day? <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, I'm not running everybody's life. I would like to in this instance, well, but I'm going to lose. Here's another great texter. Jim, why do you care how other people spend their own money? Do you not care how, I mean, do you not, would you not like public policy that is kind to people who can least yeah, afford but, to but, lose their but, money? But, but Many people get a lot of enjoyment out of playing the lottery. Like I said before, if you're making 20 bucks an hour you, you, and, and the houses in Boston cost mm. 700 grand, yeah. you know, you're not going to be able to get there ever uh, unless some windfall comes upon you. And, and are they going to win that? Is that person going to win the lottery? They're not going to win the yeah, lottery. Yeah, I'd say they're but not. But they can hope that they will win the lottery <sighs> and they can dream about, oh, if I win the money, wouldn't it be swell? I, you know, if people want to go in and spend five bucks at the 7 Eleven on the lottery, Jim. Can I tell you something, so Marjorie? What? You let me tell you, remind you of a story. A friend okay, of ours. Can you tell me another cat food story? Jim? No, I'm not. A friend of ours by the name of Sheila invited us to the opening of is it the Plain Ridge Casino? Oh Casino yeah. or the Plain that was Ville, pretty depressing. Whatever it is. So uh, we are there on the second night it opened a few years ago, and I had read in the Boston Globe about how the, on the slot machines there are normal slot machines. And then there are high roller slot machines in a separate area. Our friend Sheila walked us into the high roller area. You may or may not recall. There was one person in the area. You walked over to him. What was he doing? He was gambling with a $100 bill. $100 bills yeah. in the slot machine. And when he you said to him as a good reporter, right, he was an unemployed carpenter he was an unemployed tossing carpenter. $100 bills he was. into the slot machine. Yeah, well, he might have had a gambling problem. He, he might have had a gambling problem. So let's make more opportunities there's available. Lot, there's a lot of talk about how the closer you live to a gambling facility, exactly right. the more likely you are to develop a gambling addiction. And how, but when you do go to the uh, casinos, though, they do have these people that you can see there if you have a gambling problem. So if you run out of money, it is nice that they have them right you there. You think somebody with a gambling problem is going to say, oh, I have a gambling problem. I'm going to go see the well, person who's going to help me. I think it's kind of like you hit bottom. You know, with alcohol, you hit bottom, and then well, you finally realize you've got your act together. Maybe if you've run out of all your money at a slot machine in Everett, you see somebody there who can help you, and maybe that's the moment you turn around and ask for help as opposed to thinking you're going to do it two hours later or two days later. I like that instantaneous opportunity for help. Marion Medford, you're next on Boston Public Radio. We're live at the Boston Public Library. We're talking about the imminent arrival of sports betting in Massachusetts. Welcome. Okay, thanks. Hi. The reason I'm calling yeah. is because I know that people who bet on the lottery also do the numbers. Mm -hmm. They also do now sports betting, and then they have the casinos. So how many, how many, uh, Places can these people go and lose their money because they're all losers, and I just think that uh, people think it's just the lottery. People who can't afford it do uh, the numbers, which is illegal. They do the uh, sports mm -hmm. betting, they do the lottery, and now they go to casino. Mary, it's I want to I want to clarify for those who are angry at you because you said they're all losers. You don't mean they're all losers like a holes. You mean they're oh, all no, losers no, no. who, I by definition, that. they're going to lose money or else gambling would not be working. How do you respond to Mary, Marjorie? Well, I guess, Mary, maybe you should patrol how much your neighbors drink. I mean, should they have three beers a night? Should they have two martinis a night? I mean, I just am not into pe regulating people's vices uh, unless they're over the line. If you're, you know, if you're, if you're a chronic gambler and you've got a gambling problem, that's one thing. But I, I don't... I'm like you, Jim. I don't want to tell everybody what to do. I am. Well, Mary, I'm with you, and thank you. Mary, we're in the minority. There's no question. The vast majority of people in Massachusetts. And by the way, you heard we asked uh, uh, Attorney General Healy a couple of, uh, I guess it was last month, not the other day when she was here. She was a strong opponent of casinos, but she reluctantly, I think, said that she supports sports betting. I we think have this urge. You know, politicians have this urge thank you, Mary. To, to regulate what people do, right? They mm -hmm. didn't like sports gambling. They didn't like marijuana. They don't like people that want to have be able to uh, die at their own uh, rate right if they are, stuff. If yeah, they are they very, don't. very sick and ill. I, I think we should really get out of people's personal lives. You know what I mean? Okay. Rick and Belmont, you're next on Boston Public Radio. We're talking about sports betting coming to the Bay State. I came very cold to the Bay State. That was horrible. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> pathetic. What am I, we in the hub in the Bay State? That's Rick, I apologize. What's up? Yeah, hey, Jim and Marjorie. First time, long time. Thanks Thank for you. taking my call. Thanks. Yeah. Um, no, uh, the reason, I, first of all, I agree with you, Jim, but for a different reason. Why? And, um, yeah, my reason is because I think that depending on how it gets regulated, 
there's an opportunity here that it will uh, pit the fans against the players. So they don't just bet on the score. They bet on how many assists in the second period or how many rebounds in the fourth quarter and all kinds of details down to the nitty-gritty, and it can be done in real time with modern technology. So I think that, you know, if you're betting on a player to get a lot of rebounds in the third quarter and you're in the stands and he doesn't get it, you might throw your cloak at him or do some – behave in a way – that, um, you know, pits uh, the fans against the players. So that's my whole point, and I agree with you, but that's my reason. I, I like that reasoning. How well, do you feel about that, Again, Marjorie? I, 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 Marjorie's I don't, for throwing cokes at the no, players. No, I'm right? not. But I do think, Rick, that one of the things that they're going to do is you can't bet on local uh, college schools. So I Col mean, She's talking about the yeah, Celtics, pros. Well, I, I mean, again, we have people throwing things at athletes quite regularly, don't we? I mean, so I, it's I, okay. I, no, it's not okay, but I just don't think that's a reason to tell people they can't, they can't bet on sports. 877-301. Rick, uh, uh, thanks I do, for calling. I do like the reason, though, the ban on local, uh, because there was a scandal somewhere where kids were, throw, were yeah, throwing yeah. games, where the college kids were throwing games yeah. because of some pressure from outside or something like that. That was a local thing a while yeah, ago, wasn't I, I it? Apologize. I apologize. I don't where. remember what it was, but it was some pressures on kids to, to throw the game. Clayton from Maine, and thank you for calling. Hey, Clayton, what's up? Hey, thanks for taking my call. I'm, I'm, going, with the, I'm going with Jim the Prude here. Thank you, um, Jim the Prude. It's okay. I, I, I think, uh, you know, I think Marjorie is taking kind of a libertarian approach to this. She is. It's a little shocking. Um, Really, you know, if, if it's sports betting, that's one thing. That's really more online, and that that sort of hits a certain demographic. Um, but I lived uh, on Mission Hill for many years and saw people who, you know, really didn't have the extra money to spend, spending a lot, a lot of money on scratch tickets. And that's supposedly going to go back into our educational system. There should be a more level tax system if we're going exactly. to bolster our educational system through this. It makes no sense at all. It's really sort of passively predatorial. I think it's absolutely unhealthy. And, uh, you know, this really has nothing to do with telling people what to do. It has to do with really going to the wrong place and taxing the wrong community for these purposes. Clayton, I love you. Thank you. That was beautifully put. If you want to raise money with Clayton's saying, mm -hmm. then maybe, for example, you should, I'm not advising people yet, maybe you should vote for the millionaire's tax on the ballot because it, it makes our flat income well, tax more progressive whole, and it's a fair way to raise money. Your whole argument is about telling poor people what to do. You don't like the fact that poor people spend money on gambling that you don't think they have. It's enticement. I People can spend whatever they money they want. The, the government should and not be in the business okay. of enticing people. Then why don't people. you tell poor people they can only eat broccoli and, and healthy foods with their food stamps? Jim? Because I, why don't you stop I, them I can from answer getting the question. Fruit Loops and I can answer the question. Okay. I'm not in favor of doing that. As you know, the difference here, as I say, is we are affirmatively reaching out to them, we okay. the state, and saying, please come in here and lose your money. That's the difference. We're not we're not advertising broccoli or fruit loops for the yeah. people. The state the state is not. Okay. I just think, you know, there's sort of a there's sort of a entitlement to or, or no, there is middle not. upper no. class privilege here. By the way, they on. can do whatever they want if the government is not the actor. That's my problem here. We're providing the opportunity. I don't okay. like government. Okay. And by the way, the point that you Clayton don't like made. Government. Jim, you love no, the I government. No, I didn't finish my own <laughs> sentence. The point that Clayton made is great. If we need more money for the things you and I and most of our listeners care about, then raise it equitably. Would you not agree with what Clayton no, had to say? No, absolutely. I, the I mean, legislators the are too scared to deal with the tax system, so they, we should they have, enable gambling. You know what, Jim? You no. were right 25 years ago. We should yeah. have a graduated income tax in the state of Massachusetts, which we don't, and like we have a graduated income tax at the federal level, but the we problem do. is uh, the federal tax system, as we all know, is weighted toward the very wealthy instead of the kind of people that you're worried about. By the way, I did in 1994. I led you the did. effort in the state to amend the Constitution. And as you know, Marjorie, uh, we lost by a narrow margin. Do you remember what the final outcome was? Was it like 70 to 20 71 or to 29. <laughs> we lost by a mere 42 points. But you put in the effort, Jim. I and, did put in you, the effort. You were, you were correct. Let's go to, uh, are we going to? By the way, you say I'm correct. I guarantee you. What? That as a columnist for the Boston Herald, you were against what I was doing. You didn't know me then, and I didn't know you then. But in light of the fact, I did, I was I involved. I don't think at that point in my I career. I was involved in a ballot campaign yeah. in 1990. Uh, uh, 
-hmm. that was one of the highest profile. We would have been the single largest budget cut on the ballot as a percentage in American history. I opposed that the legendary Barbara Anderson, Citizens for Living with Taxation, right. proposed that Marjorie wrote a column. She had never met me. Never. That is not Excuse true. Excuse me, not You've done. Forgotten. She had never met me. I had interviewed and you what in did an you say? Pan, How'd you describe you me? About How'd you describe me? What was oh. I wearing? <laughs> You were wearing you were wearing whale a whale belt on your on your right. pants. And no, no, you had the you had the save the whale license plate. No, which that's you did. not what you said. What did you I said say? I was driving a Volvo station wagon, which, you were. which I did not own for three years. <laughs> it was precious. After that, and I, I was not wearing a whale vision. belt. You wrote that I was wearing whale pants. Even worse, you know those little <laughs> preppy kind of pants with little whales on. Was I doing either? Jim, I flattered you. I called you the heartthrob of you did. Econ 101. You actually did. You Wasn't did that say nice? That. You I did said say that, that about you, and I had met you. You just forgot that's how much of an impression I made. Was I wearing well, whale pants? No, you were not wearing. You did have the Save the Whale uh, license plate. I did. Oh. Lenny from Nashua, thank you for calling. Hey, Lenny. Hi. Um, Hi. What's up? I owned a convenience store for 21 years, Ooh. and we were in the top 10% of sales in the state. Wow. And in all those years, I saw so many people spending. Hundreds of dollars a week. We sold one ten thousand dollar ticket in twenty one years. Marjorie. One. Well, you're in a position, to, uh, having had this first in experience. Love what learning. do you think? What do you think? Should we disallow gambling? Um, I personally don't think we should dictate that to people, but I I don't approve of it. I, I think people are very naive, and I think. Unfortunately, you know, but like Marjorie, like you said earlier, people need to dream because the reality is they're not going to buy the $700,000 house. Yeah. So on Lenny, $20 an hour. So. I'm thrilled that you called. And again, one $10,000 winner. And how many years? 21 years, Lenny? 21 years. 21 years. 21 years. You okay. know, do you, get, do you get any kind of award for, yeah. uh, for being in the top 10% of sales? So do you get, do you, do you get, they give you, throw you a few grand? Or not? No. Not, just nothing? Just bragging rights. No. Oh, just well. bragging rights. But we did get it. I think we did get, I, I believe now, I sold my store in 2003, but I think we got 5% of our sales. Wow. So whatever, that was a huge income maker for, for us. Hey, uh, Lenny, we really appreciate your call. Thanks well, that's for another, uh, that's another reason. It. Listen to that. What? I'm supporting all the small business people that sell lottery tickets, Jim. That's an excellent point. <laughs> okay. By the way, once again, the Senate president will be with us on May 13th. Uh, obviously, the bill. Fun and she, she wouldn't, do you see, she wouldn't say how she would have voted. We will get her to tell us how she would have voted. She was not Karen a fan. Spilka. She was not a fan. She ultimately allowed the vote to happen. Without her approval, the vote couldn't have happened. So I'm assuming what the truth is, she opposed it but knew the overwhelming percentage of senators supported it, so she allowed it to happen. Can we, we make take a little announcement here? We have 30, no, not, after we come back. Oh, we after 30 we come seconds. back, okay. Uh, yeah, we're gonna, be, we're gonna be joined by the artist from Fenway Studios. Her annual open studio is this weekend, and it's time to celebrate these new efforts. They're gonna, they're helped to create affordable housing, but they have some art. We're gonna tell you all about what's going on at Fenway Studios this weekend. Um, it's a really great organization. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. You're listening to Boston Public Radio with Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. Just ahead, more smart conversation about what's going on in our community. That's right after an NPR news break here on GBH News 89.7. Support for GBH comes from you and South County, Rhode Island, featuring 100 miles of coastline and 20 public beaches. South County visitors can find many ways to enjoy the water in the ocean state. Learn more at southcountyri.com. You know the answers to a lot of questions, except for this one. Who will be the next high school quiz show champion? Catch the next quarterfinal on High School Quiz Show, Saturday at 6 on GBH2. Trusted. Local. News. This is 89.7 WGBH. WGBH HD1 Boston. Online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. Ahead on Boston Public Radio, a scathing report on Mission Hill K-8 school found administrators put kids in danger by failing to respond to allegations of sexual abuse and bullying. 
superintendent now says the school will close by the end of the year, but will anybody be held accountable? Former Education Secretary Paul Revel joins us. Marjorie Taylor Greene is trying to distance herself from the January 6th insurrection in the face of a lawsuit seeking to bar her from running for re-election. Media maven Sue O'Connell will weigh in on that. And MIT's It's All About Banana Student Lounge. We'll hear some Baroque music live here from players at Boston's famed Handel and Haydn Society. Then we'll open the lines and ask you about kissing in virtual reality. If things on Match.com are not working out, could the metaverse fill the gap? All that and more ahead on Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBA. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. A senior U.S. defense official says Russian forces are attempting to advance on three separate fronts in eastern Ukraine to surround Ukrainian troops. The process is being described as slow and uneven. The official says that faced with stiff Ukrainian resistance, Russia is cautious about moving too far ahead of its own supply lines, as it had done earlier in the conflict. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian capital is reeling from missile attacks that killed at least one person and wounded nine others. And Paris Frank Langfitt has more. A cruise missile came out of Russian-controlled Crimea in the south, and it looks like it flew over this missile parts factory here in the heart of Kiev and hit the bottom of a relatively new residential apartment building and it blew out the bottom three floors. And just a moment ago, workers, they've been working here with heavy equipment to dig in under the foundation. They just brought out a body uh, in a body bag and put it in a green van. A very somber scene here in what was an attempt, obviously, to hit a missile factory, but hit a residential building instead. Frank Langford, NPR News, Kiev. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres was in Kyiv yesterday during Russia's attacks. A mosque in the Afghan capital has been hit. Reuters New Service quoting the head of the Khalifa Saib Mosque saying an explosion killed more than 50 worshippers. It's the latest in a series of attacks on civilians during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Meanwhile, a former Afghan general says he and many other former politicians and members of the Afghan military are preparing to launch military operations against the Taliban. Lieutenant General Sami Sadat, who had just taken over command of Afghan special forces when the government collapsed last August, tells the BBC that they've put up with more than eight months of increasingly harsh Taliban rule. Every day I see in my phone getting hundreds of messages from young girls, young boys, from doctors and officers and says we've been tortured, we've been oppressed, we've been disrespected, and what are you going to do about it? Lieutenant General Sadat in an interview with the BBC. Republicans are favored to win control of the House of Representatives this fall. NPR's Domenico Montanero reports a new NPR PBS NewsHour poll helps explain why. The national survey of almost 1,200 registered voters was conducted from April 19th through the 26th. It found Republicans ahead on the question of who people said they would vote for in their congressional elections if they were held today. They were up by a 47 to 44 percent margin. While that may not seem like a huge advantage, it's the first time Republicans have had the edge on that question in eight years in the Marist poll. It's also a swing from last year when Democrats were still ahead. On the issues, respondents said they trusted Republicans more on some key ones like national security, crime, and importantly, inflation, which many Americans are saying is their top concern. Domenico Montanaro, NPR News, Washington. This is NPR. Good afternoon from the GBH Radio Newsroom in Boston. I'm Henry Santoro in studio today. U.S. Attorney General uh, Rachel Rollins is urging the city of Springfield to move forward on proposed reforms to its troubled police department. A judge has yet to sign off on Springfield's consent decree with the federal government over alleged civil rights violations. But Rollins says nothing is stopping the city from acting sooner. I want to believe that the mayor and the commissioner are actively working on many of the things that we're talking about right now so that they aren't just starting once the judge says moving forward we're going to do this. Rollins made her comments at a public meeting this week on the consent decree. The agreement announced earlier this month would require several changes to the Springfield Police Department's policies that includes more detailed tracking of officers use of force and a requirement that officers speak up when their colleagues use excessive force. A former employee of the state agency that oversees unemployment insurance benefits has been sentenced to three and a half years behind bars for using her job to fraudulently apply for federal COVID-19 relief funds. 
36-year-old Tiffany Pacquio was also ordered by a federal judge to pay restitution of nearly $200,000, and this wasn't her first run-in with the law. Pacquio had previously spent time behind bars on an identity theft conviction. Prosecutors said she uh, used stolen identities to apply for benefits and also manipulated the computer system at the Department of Unemployment Assistance to increase her benefits, and her husband and a friend have already been sentenced to prison for their roles in the scheme. 48 degrees. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include C3AI. C3AI software enables organizations to use artificial intelligence at enterprise scale, solving previously unsolvable problems. C3AI is enterprise AI. You don't need a library card to go see Jim and Marjorie at the Boston Public Library. This is GBH News. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. This is We are broadcasting live as we do every Friday from the uh, Boston Public Library, 89.7 GBH. Hello again, Jim. Hello again, Marjorie. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. And we are streaming on YouTube.com slash GBH News for you losers who decided not to come. <laughs> so it, it's been... I'm only kidding, of course. <laughs> not really. It's been almost three years since artists at the Fenway Studios were able to hold an out, open studio weekend. But this weekend is it. Here to tell us about that and a whole host of wonderful things they're doing over there is Peter Scott. Peter's the current board president at Fenway Studios Cooperative. He's also a professor of the practice at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts. His work is represented by Gallery Naga. Is that how you say it? Naga. Naga, thank you. Robert Bart is a retired faculty member of the School of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and has his painting studio at historic Fenway Studios. Currently has an exhibit at M Fine Arts Gallery in Boston. Did I get that wrong, that's, too? No, that's correct. One out of two ain't bad. The open studio event will be held indoors tomorrow, both indoors and outdoors on Sunday. It's on Ipswich Street in the Fenway. They're going to explain all the details in a minute. Peter and Robert, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. So let, let's start with you, Peter, because we, we have met before. For people who don't know what's going on down there at the Fenway Studios, what is going on? So, uh, yeah, like Jim said, uh, Given the uh, past uh, several years uh, uh, hiatus of uh, open studios, uh, we uh, that our timing has been, uh, I think, fairly impeccable. Uh, uh, <laughs> shortly before the pandemic, we decided to kind of turn a large uh, studio into smaller studio rentals for emerging artists, um, as well as a, uh, a gallery space. Uh, a community gallery space. And so uh, uh, what should have taken probably about six to nine months took two and a half years. Oh, gosh. You know, it's just like, um, <laughs> so we're actually doing a ribbon cutting. Uh, and um, we did have, over the past winter, a kind of small um, by appointment only show with uh, seniors uh, from Boston Arts Academy, uh, which actually was nice. But it is like a case of. Uh, dealing with uh, COVID restrictions, staffing, and stuff like that. So it really was mostly for them and to have a venue. Um, but, but overall, but overall, this is a place where artists can live and do their work. And give oh, people the overall picture. The overall. So Fenway Studios is a co-op. And it was founded uh, back in 1980, Robert? 79, 80. Yeah. So it was. Um, and as a co-op, it's a limited equity co-op, co so it remains affordable housing. Uh, they're live-in studios. Um, there's a vetting process to become a member. Um, the, the basement, uh, the new studio uh, rentals are for non-members uh, and emerging artists with kind of an option for a three-year affordable lease for it. I uh, work only studio space. Uh, Can we stay on that for a second, Robert? Yeah. I, we've talked to other people, city leaders, others, Mayor Walsh, we talked about it a lot. Emerging artists, I mean, we've heard, read so many stories, having to leave town, they not only can't afford studio space, they can't afford to live. I mean, this is filling a hole that is gaping and critical for the city, no? Yes, I would say that, uh, just a little background for those who don't know, the Fenway Studios was built in 1905, mm. and it's never had any other occupants other than artists. That's great. And, uh, and we ran into some trouble because the building was never maintained over many years, and we had DC current in 1979. Oh. 
And so when the renovations took place, we opened it up to a co-op. We bought the building. We aren't going to go anywhere. We're stable. We have about, we have 45 studios and uh, it's, it's been running really well. And yes, we are protected, but we're very concerned about artists in the city who are losing their studios. And uh, so we're providing a little way in for some of the uh, younger artists and hopefully maybe they'll become full-time members at some point. Is this one of the features, the, the light in these yes. um, apartments? Uh, Tell us about that, Robert. Well, north light is what artists crave. Now, not everybody does, uh, depending on the nature of your work, but at the turn of the century, artists were doing portraits and, make, and commissions, and uh, one direct light where you have no shadows. North light provides uh, no shadows, so you don't have to worry about the sun moving through your studio. So, so everybody's fighting for apartments with <laughs> the north light? Well, they're all north. <laughs> Everyone they're all in the place. north. Yes, the building faces the Mass Pike. It's all north. The windows are 16 feet high. Uh, the ceilings are 16. The windows are 12 feet. It's wonderful. Peter, wow. where does the money come from for all this? Who's <laughs> funding this stuff? Me. <laughs> we are. Now, yes. Is that no, true through no. this co-op thing? Is yes. that no, how it's yeah, this is, uh, it really is. There's a, in terms of... Uh, uh, this is the limited equity uh, aspect of this. It, the buy-in cost to become a member and to kind of acquire shares um, uh, in terms of kind of market price is uh, very, very low. Uh, it is uh, so, uh, but we, once you become a member and you own shares, then you uh, basically uh, have a proprietary lease and so you're paying rent. The rent is basically uh, I would say maybe half of what market value would mm -hmm. be. Uh, but we are uh, having to do deal with our management company, financial advisors, uh, you know, uh, financing our mortgage, et cetera, just like everybody else who's a homeowner. Uh, but it is a co-op. And so we are uh, having to kind of uh, deal with the ongoing maintenance of a 100-plus-year-old building. Um, right now we are in the process of a couple of million dollar uh, uh, repointing process uh, for the building. I would assume artists are rotten business people though. Is that a, a we, fair uh, generalization? <laughs> no. Some are better than others. I mean but, that uh, lovingly. Yeah. But Same I mean. to you, buddy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, uh, Robert, back to you for this one. Sure. You know, historically, and, and I'm not you know, I may be ignorant about a lot of this, but historically, just from what I know, you hear about artists being in certain parts of different cities. I remember like back in the 80s, you know, when Tribeca was still sort of yeah. all these lofts. You had yes. artists and musicians down you there. You can look now, at up for this. Right. Yeah. yeah, it yeah. was, and, and now it's a fortune to be there, and, yeah. and that's Absolutely. kind of what's happening with Absolutely. Boston. So what does this mean? And I would imagine if you're an artist, you might want to be in a city where there's a lot of activity. So what is the soaring prices in so many cities mean for the young well, artist? It, it, it basically moves them out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it, yeah. you know, the, the days of uh, Fort Point uh, Piano Factory, uh, yes. Soa and stuff, are they've all been uh, condoized. Uh, and so uh, the nature of a co-op, especially in a limited equity co-op, gives you uh, some autonomy and kind of protection. Um, and we are seeing you know, in Fenway area, as you guys know, a huge amount <laughs> of construction uh, and development going on, uh, really right outside our door with Parcel 12. Uh, yeah, the piano factory is that is the huge where the chicken pianos used right. to be made yeah. on Mass Avenue, down yeah. right uh, around Tremont the corner. Street. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful building. Yeah, but yeah. but uh, I didn't know it would have been all condoized. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. that's how they disappear. And like you say, uh, artists have always settled into the areas that were neglected. And then once the developers see, oh, potential there, the artists have to move out. And That's the voice happening. of Robert Bart. Yep. The other gentleman here is Peter Scott from Fenway Studios. So before you tell us about this weekend and what people have in store if they show up, this is odd on the radio, but we are streaming and there are people here. Starting with you, Peter, we asked you to bring a little bit of your own art. What did you bring with us? Uh, uh, it's a, yeah, Can you it's hold a, it up in yeah, front of you? Yeah, where should he point it? Uh, I think right in front of your chest is what <laughs> right you should there. do. Right yeah, there. Yeah, the little that kind of flashing thing. What is that? So this is just a, uh, it got matted, uh, so it looks uh, a little nicer and uh, more formal, but the, uh, it is a sketchbook drawing. Oh, there we go. Yes, uh, there That's it actually is. quite nice. Yeah. yeah. I don't mean the art. I mean, the, the, uh, the visual is quite nice, so but go the, ahead. 
But uh, for about seven years, uh, our family was uh, more or less based in Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, and if anybody knows anything about Gallup, it's a major train hub. And if you are crossing Third Street, of which this is the crossing, uh, if you're caught behind the gate, you may be sitting there for about a half an hour, 45 <laughs> train, minutes. That's great. Uh, because there are like, you know, 100 car trains. I think there's something like 100 trains that go through Gallup a day. Uh, but the freight, the, the, you know, the freight that goes through uh, from Southern California, LA and San Diego East, uh, basically goes through this line. Uh, so I figured rather than hate it, I would draw it. <laughs> By the way, I'm told the artists there are much better business people. So, <laughs> so no, that's a trading post. <laughs> so, Robert, what did you? Uh, what of uh, your work did you bring with us? Well, I brought two uh, two small paintings that. Uh, okay. They'll get you in a minute. Two small paintings. Uh, I work uh, with both acrylics and oil. These are two small pieces. Uh, I work much larger, but uh, my imagery is derived from nature and the landscape. It's abstract. I rely on uh, color. Uh, you know, innate atmosphere, color, and light. So they're uh, abstract, but they uh, represent the landscape. They're pretty accessible, I would say, as paintings go. And what's yes. the other one? It's, uh, it's also a... Variation uh, on the same Do you want me to hold one? Yeah, yeah, sure, Peter, thanks. Yeah, it's a variation, but it's, uh, again, it's all done in my studio from imaginations, but I did a lot of backpacking and bird watching and walking, et cetera. I, during COVID, I walked from Brookline Village to my studio because I didn't want to take the tea. I've never owned a car, mm. so uh, I'm on the trail. You've uh, never owned never a car? Never owned a car. Have you lived here your whole life? Yep. yep. Wow. Never. Oh, I rent you, occasionally, Colin. but. What do you do in the winter? I walk. You Put do? the parka on and walk. My God. So, I'm but I walk actually. through four seasons from Brookline Village to Fenway Studios along the Muddy River. In That's and beautiful. Out. Wow. Yeah, so That's beautiful. It's great. Well, thanks. There's a good shot up there. That is a actually, it's a beautiful shot. Yes, it is. Nice. So beautiful work, by so the way. So this Thank weekend, you. people can come and view the various artists' works in the studios right. and uh, make purchases if uh, they are so inclined. I, I, right. I won't be open because all my new work's at my exhibit. So oh, okay. I, I usually am open, but I'm not so organized. To, uh, okay, to, other than you, uh, yeah. uh, if we come. <laughs> Peter. Tell us what, it, I, I said at the beginning, but I confused myself. <laughs> one day's indoor, one day's indoor, outdoor. What are those days? Okay. And what will people be treated to should they appear? Super. So uh, Saturday is indoor, and uh, we have something like 30 studios open. Wow. Uh, and I will say that uh, given um, the location, uh, there is going to be a request. Uh, masks will be required. Good. Uh, but the... Uh, um, uh, Sunday, we actually will be closing off Ipswich Street. Uh, so it will be uh, a couple of uh, kind of tents and exhibits out of doors. Uh, there will be a food truck, I think an ice cream truck. Yes. Oh, neat. Yes. Oh, boy. Let's hope for warmer weather. And, um, music. and also, starting around 11, uh, we will have musicians, um, local musicians. Um, one musician from Boston Arts Academy, uh, I think a combo from uh, 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 Berkeley, uh, and then uh, two musicians I know quite well who are both museum school and uh, uh, Berkeley grads, uh, and uh, as well as BAA grads. Uh, Terrific. So um, it should be fun. It That's be indoor and out on Sunday. Yeah, the yes. music will be outdoors. You know, Robert, you may not be able to appreciate that. Neither of you may because you're both artists. But as a non-artist, whether it's when I've come to Fenway or to SOA, as a non-artist, being in an artist's studio is really mm -hmm. thrilling. I mean, it really, not just seeing their work, but seeing their the stuff that they use to produce what you got. It's really a great Kind of. It's you're been welcome. two and a half years since I've cleaned my studio. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you're welcome anytime. Now, one thing about the building is that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's historic. It's a jewel of Boston. It's famous for its uh, landmark architecture. Uh, we are a national landmark building, and uh, nobody knows about us. 
We really well, they do now, them. my they friend. Do. I know. And by the way, speaking of nobody knows, I have to do a shout out, which I almost never do. You have a colleague, Linda McNally, who is, is uh, like yeah. a force of nature. We, we know. <laughs> on Fenway Studios. <laughs> yes. She is on, and she, they're she is relentless. Wonderful. She is I, great. I think our next Nor'easter will name her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, she sends she me little really candies some, in the mail, yeah, a little, yeah. little no, trinket. No, she's promoting she's the wonderful she work that I, you I, and your colleagues do. Yeah, she's terrific. And it's and it's all pro bono. Yeah. And it's all, we also have Friends of Fenway Studio, which is an R. Uh, fundraising arm, which we're hoping to get more money now that we have a community benefit in the studio. It's hard to get grants in general, but we try. Well, we hope people show up. You're doing wonderful things there. Both the art and the project is great. And it's great to see you both again. Good luck this weekend Thank you in the so future. much for coming in. Thank you so much. Thank you Thanks very much Thanks for, for having, having us. us. Yeah. This has Thanks. been great. Peter Scott and Robert Bart are artists with Fenway Studios. Their co-op really is housed in their annual open studio event this weekend. As we just said, indoors and outdoors. On Sunday on Ipswich Switch in the Fenway. Indoors tomorrow, but outdoors on Sunday and indoors. Um, thank you both for coming in. Coming up. Former Education Secretary Paul Revel is here on huge headlines this week in the world of education, including a really horrific scandal involving the Mission Hill School in Jamaica Plain and Harvard's report on the century-old ties to slavery. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. Uh, we are broadcasting live as we do every Friday from the Boston Public Library. Former President Donald Trump lost Michigan by more than 154,000 votes, and many still insist the election was stolen, including some who would have to certify upcoming elections. And you just wonder, could we have a situation this November where some of these counties don't certify the election? Is there a looming election crisis in Michigan? This afternoon on All Things Considered from NPR News. Today at 4, here on GBH News 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Comcast Business, offering Security Edge, an internet security solution that helps block threats like malware, ransomware, phishing, and botnet attacks across all connected devices. Restrictions apply. ComcastBusiness.com. And Boston Ballet, presenting Mindscape, a program featuring two world premieres by choreographers William Forsyth and Yorma Ello, live on stage May 5th to 15th at the Citizens Bank Opera House. Tickets at BostonBallet.org. <laughs> Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Mardrigan. We're live at the Boston Public Library. And we're also streaming somewhere. Where are we streaming exactly? We're streaming on YouTube.com slash GBH News. But I, again, I would be here if I were you. About 40 minutes away from uh, Handel and Haydn performing. And we are really, really excited. And you should be too. We're joined by Paul Revel. Paul, Paul's the former Secretary of Education for Massachusetts. He's now a professor at Harvard University's Graduate School of Education, where he also runs the Education Redesign Lab. His latest book, co-author with Lynn Sachs, is Collaborative Action for Equity and Opportunity, a Practical Guide for School and Community Leaders. Paul Revel, good to see you. Great to be here, Jim and Marjorie, hey. especially in this venue. I Isn't know. It Isn't it great yeah. to be great, back here? Great. We're so glad that we're here. Uh, so, Paul Revel, starting with a tough story, we had uh, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu with us yesterday, and we asked her about this investigative report into this K-8 school in Jamaica Plain, the Mission Hill School, where apparently there has been uh, sexual abuse of kids, uh, bullying of kids, uh, inadequate education for disabled kids, just a nightmare of horror. She called it exactly that. She called it a uh, nightmare when she was with us yesterday, the stuff of nightmares, she said. And uh, I can't imagine, and, and it was ignored or just downplayed or nothing was done for years. How does this happen? Well, it, it's, it strikes me as a gross, uh, gross negligence all along the way. Uh, the, the mayor certainly had it right in terms of talking about this. It's every parent's nightmare, every grandparent's nightmare, what happened there. Uh, it sounds like a situation in which a school was given a lot of autonomy, and uh, uh, the leadership of that school uh, chose to uh, look the other way year after year for inexplicable reasons to things that were criminal. There's a 189-page report. I assume that... Uh, uh, the Attorney General and others are going to be looking into charges to be filed here. The superintendent's already announced that she intends to close the school in what's a, a pretty dramatic uh, act, but you have to ask the question, uh, how did this go unattended, not just within the school, but within the system 
below those many years over several superintendencies. And uh, it's just uh, one more uh, kind of negative on the Boston Public Schools at a time when the school system can ill afford it. You know, uh, uh, the corollary to how to go on for so long is what I broached with the mayor yesterday, is what always worries me most about these kinds of stories when something is covered up this grotesque for this long is how can anybody in authority say with certainty that there's not another Mission Hill nightmare at another school that hasn't yet seen the light of day. If they could get, a law, get away with this for so many years, they could get away with it down the street or in another part of the city. Is that... Uh, well, there's a lot of vulnerability in a large public school system like this, and particularly if you're, you know, you're in an administration where, you know, for several administrations, they've been encouraging, you know, schools to have autonomy and to define their own uh, values and operating procedures and things of this nature. And the supervision by the downtown office is only occasional, and uh, so you can get by with things like this. So it's. It, it, uh, it speaks deeply to what kind of accountability we need, um, both as a state and as uh, individually as school system. So if you were the Secretary of Education today, as opposed to when you were, and uh, your Commissioner of Education, Riley, was looking at whether receivership, which we've talked about a lot, was a possibility that neither the outgoing superintendent nor the mayor wants to have happen, would this disaster, this nightmare, as Mayor Wu called it, way on that decision? Well, I mean, I think we're getting to a tipping point where, it, particularly in terms of just the general public's perception of what's going on in the Boston public schools. I mean, it's, it's a barrage of one story after the next of systemic failure at some level. However, if I were Secretary of Education again and looking at that, I'd have to take into account what my capacity at the state level is to remedy this. I mean, there are, there are no silver bullets here. A lot of people are looking for a new superintendent to walk on water and fix all these things overnight. That's not realistic. That's not going to happen. Nor, nor is it necessarily the case that the state could move in and turn this around because this is a huge school system. And states in general, uh, you know, the track record across the country is uh, taking over school districts does not lead to improvement in academic performance. It sometimes solves problems of fiscal management and things of that nature, but it hasn't been particularly effective, with the notable exception of Lawrence, headed up by our current commissioner when he was receiver there. Picked by you, I should and say, yeah. to be the receiver, well, yeah. What, what I don't understand is, is you have these great stories of success, even in inner city schools, nativity schools that are run, actually they're Catholic schools, but that, where was the school where the kids all wound up getting into the, um, we talked about this the other day. Oh, the Benjamin Dearborn Franklin. Stand. Yeah. Dearborn Stand. Yeah. Yeah, the they got into Benjamin Franklin, Franklin. Cummings you know, Institute Franklin. of Technology. Uh, obviously, there are certain schools that are succeeding. So I always wonder why those those successes can't be replicated. Why is it so difficult for those successes to be replicated elsewhere? Because some schools do work with poor kids, with kids who they come do, from yeah. disadvantaged neighborhoods. Yeah, we've been pretty poor in education in general at scaling success. I mean, there's there's a lot of kind of uh, automatic marginalization sometimes in the education sector where we say, okay, that's okay for them, that works for them with their kids in that situation, but that's not us, even if it demographically looks similar. And uh, there's just an enormous amount of inertia that gets locked into the way we currently do things and various constituencies from parents to teachers to students themselves to administrators, teachers, unions, whatever, uh, make it difficult to change the way things currently happen. So inertia and complacency are our biggest enemy in terms of education reform in the sector. Yeah, I know everybody says it's really hard if you're a poor kid and you're, is, you have to go through poverty and racism and all the difficulties there. But, but obviously, poor kids, black kids, kids of color, can learn in the right environment. Oh, there's no question. It's not, it's not a function of ability. It really is a function of opportunity. You know, we talk a lot about, uh, I, I know the, the MCAS scores are on the list of things to talk about this week, but you know, you talk about the correlation between educational attainment and achievement and socioeconomic status. That has nothing to do with ability. It has everything to do with opportunity. opportunity right. And yeah. so if we don't provide an equal share of opportunities uh, to people who've had significant challenges in life, challenges of poverty and everything else, if we don't put them on a level playing field with those who happen through the accident of birth to be brought into rich, constant opportunity, then there's no hope that schools, which take up only 20% of a children's waking hours, of a child's waking hours between kindergarten and grade 12, schools aren't on average going to make up all that gap. Right. 
So, 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 so oh, oh, go you ahead. want to stay on this? You want to move? I was going to move to the MCAS. Yeah, I mean, you're responsible for MCAS. And uh, <laughs> no, you are. I mean, <laughs> I, M, you my, are. Kid, my kids seem to think that. No, and but we you are responsible Paul for, for that. MCAS. Because yeah. finally, Marjorie, my kids learned subject and verb. They learned about verbs okay, after fine. the MCAS came Marjorie out. and I almost it's came to blow this morning before the show. Okay. So, uh, about MCAS. <laughs> oh, boy. Not surprising. Again. <laughs> Again. Yeah. So, before we get back into it, and hopefully we won't, but can you, what's being contemplated? What changes are being contemplated, and why are the changes a good or a bad idea, Paul Revel? Okay, well, let me, let me put sort of an umbrella over this and say, you know, part of where we land in this conversation depends on how you define equity. And is equity defined by giving children and students the skills and knowledge they need to be successful when they move on from school in college or career? Or is equity defined by, you know, having everybody rewarded for making a fair effort and being good kids? So that, that's part of the way in which at least the lens I apply to this. I see uh, educational measurement and standardized testing, not as an, uh, not as an uh, g undiluted good, uh, it's, a, it's a blunt instrument that gets used to keep track of whether or not we're making progress in educating children. The data would suggest we're not doing a very effective job at educating young people to be prepared for college. Students who pass MCAS or get a waiver to, um, to move beyond MCAS and fulfill it by course taking requirements are on average not well prepared to succeed in college. We had a massive study from Brown University that took a look at those who succeed and those who don't, and it correlates with your performance on MCAS. So it doesn't mean MCAS, MCAS isn't a strategy, it's a measurement tool. You don't fatten a cow by weighing it, but you have to measure progress periodically if you're gonna correct your action and move forward. So this is an attempt to raise the graduation standard, which after all, MCAS is a 10th grade test, is only set at a 10th grade level. We have roughly two thirds of the students who go on to our community colleges having passed MCAS and need to do remedial yeah. work in order to uh, enter community college. So it's obvious that the passing score on MCAS right now is too low. This is a very modest attempt to raise it a little bit so that students do in fact have the skills and knowledge to succeed in college. Because if we're, if we're sending kids along to college because we're basically socially promoting them, we're not doing them a favor. We are not. But we're by well, raising the threshold alone, we're not doing them any favors well, either. No, we, didn't mention, we didn't mention the part in here yeah. that they want to push, and this is what the uh, board of Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education was talking about, pushing uh, schools to better support these kids, supplying these kids with tutors to help them get through the test, all the, to share the plans with the parents, these steps to help tutors kids. Tutors to get through the test. I think that's the operative language to get through the well, test. Well, it depends. But, but it depends if you have a test worth teaching to. You know, one of the one of the most commonly used pejoratives in this discussion is teaching, teaching to the to test, the test right. which exactly. is automatically assumed to be a bad thing. Except if you have a good test. You know, if you go to the Olympics and the test is your final performance in front of the judges, that's your test that you take. So it's everything leading up to the test that makes it worthwhile or not worthwhile. When I was when I used to be defending MCAS back in the old days when we were first getting started, I'd say, let's, let's take a question. So there was a question on the eighth grade MCAS at the time that said uh, to, to children, uh, think about a book that you've read recently, think about a secondary character, and write an essay on why you think that character, why the author included that character as part of telling the story. And I said, I don't know what you think, but I think that would be a decent test question to have my child taught to. So the question is, can we develop, and I think we've done a decent job in Massachusetts by comparison with other states. 40% of our MCAS tests are open-ended questions that have to be you know, judged qualitatively. I think we've done a decent job of producing a test that, um, that you'd want your children prepared for. They, so, but it really what we're aiming at is, can we measure the skills and knowledge, which I think we can at a fairly basic level, that will be required to be successful in college or in entry-level jobs in a high-skill, high-knowledge economy. Well, the thing that we, you and I always argue about, argue about <coughs> is the old story about the kids getting out of high school and not being able to pass. This was years ago, but you may remember this, the Gorton's fish test. Uh, go, if you want to get a to job, work there, right. to work there, and you, you, you weren't able to fill out the job application. And that is horrible, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You're going to be 19 years old, you're going to go back now and try to learn how to 
fill out a job application because you couldn't learn well enough reading and writing in school. I mean, that's, that's but, but the problem, you're doomed. The, the, the important point that you referenced, Marjorie, is that this measure that the Board of Education is looking at um, goes to the front end and says to districts, you're going to have to do more by way of preparing young people to have the skills and knowledge earlier on. Yeah. So one, one dilemma that we have in education is we've asked for world-class standards in terms of student achievement, but we've asked schools to do it in the same amount of time and with the same curriculum that they used to have. Instead of recognizing, for example, that some kids are going to need uh, much more time to learn a set of basic skills than other kids because the other kids will have had opportunities to learn it outside of school and home. Well, that's part so, of your book, arguing right. about every the, and the individualization of education. Yeah, so you've got to meet the kids where they are, yeah. give them what they need, which means some kids need more time than other kids, and that means a school system that looks very different than the one-size-fits-all factory model that we currently have. And that is inconvenient for adults, and that's when the resistance to change sets in. We're talking to Paul uh, Revel. You know, Paul, one of the really troubling things we read in anticipation of you coming this morning, neither of which was a great surprise, is one, teacher burnout on the rise. We're talking about primary care physicians burnout on the rise and colossal level of absenteeism right. uh, in great part tied to the mental health uh, uh, trickle down effect of uh, the pandemic. And we talked to you during the worst of the pandemic about what the long, it's sort of like long haul COVID in education kind of thing, even if you didn't get COVID. Did educators underestimate what the longer term negative impact of two years of remote learning, if you logged on at all, was going to be for young kids in this country? I, I wouldn't say that educators underestimated. I think like all of us, it's, this is an unfolding crisis and they didn't anticipate certain things that are happening now and those things are happening, by the way, to them as well as to students. So I think one of the, one of the things that we've got to pay more attention than we have is to the mental health and, and well-being and morale of our teachers. I mean, the, the next big crisis in education is a labor shortage. We have, t we have you know, teacher shortages. We have shortages of administrators. Uh, we, we have a substantial number of principals who are going to be stepping down to Boston Public Schools, for example. Over 800 vacancies with respect to teaching and substitute Out of how positions. many teachers is that 800 or the 800? Uh, I, don't know the, I don't know the total number of teachers, but it's, it, it's you know, I don't know, somewhere between three and 5,000 teachers. So it's a, it's a substantial Huge. number of teachers. And so uh, the, the, the problem here is, uh, do we have a profession that's attractive enough and sustaining enough to draw talented people to want to do it and stick with it over time? And, and I think we, uh, all across the country, there, there are worries about labor shortage. We've got massive retirements going on. We've got people leaving for health reasons, of one kind or another. And then we've got all these controversies, you know, these uh, critical race theory controversies and the social and emotional health controversies that have come along. MCAS controversies. And, and, and all this. And teachers feel like they're in the hot seat. No matter what they do, they can't do the right thing. It's an unattractive position for a lot of people. So now. Brenda Caselius, the outgoing superintendent, wrote a piece in the Washington Post that we discussed yeah. with her about ways to retain uh, uh, teachers. I know there's no magic formula, but what are the people like you constructing that's going to fill this hole, not in the long term, but in the short term, like with those 800 vacancies? Well, I think, number one, you've got to, you've got to think financially. You've got to think about financial supports for teachers. I mean, in, in Boston, we pay teachers pretty well. We still have a residency requirement. That might be waived in order to get people. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to, we didn't need to force people to live in Boston these days, given the housing market that's here. Uh, so I think incentives that you can hold out to people for participating, I think as a profession, we need to do a better job of preparing people coming into the field for the kinds of um, challenges that they're facing and working with different kinds of students than many of them have seen in the past. I think we need to do a better job of mentoring and inducting teachers when they get there. We need to do a better job of supervision and evaluation and supporting them and providing incentives for performance and high levels of performance in the field. So there are a lot of things that we can do. I don't think we've made an attractive, sustaining profession. And that's, that was a problem before COVID. 
that problem is exacerbated. How available are, are loan forgiveness uh, programs for uh, for would-be teachers? Well, they're becoming more. You know, you see districts experimenting with these around the country. You also see, see some districts, for example, dealing with a situation we have in Boston, which is it's, it's very difficult to find housing for teachers or for teachers to find affordable housing. So you have some districts actually buying buildings for housing for teachers to create an incentive really? uh, for them to uh, take a teaching job in a particular city where the housing prices are unaffordable. You know, Paul Revel, we, we've been hearing for years how some people have these built-in biases against math. Often girls, you know, are, are not into math. There's reasons people yep. freak out about math. And so then you heard about efforts by educators to try to ease people's anxiety over math. Um, but apparently, you know, thinking about that and your, uh, your feelings about math <laughs> Uh, have run into this guy, what's his name, Rufo? Chris Rufo at the Manhattan Institute, yeah. yeah. about somehow thinking that um, talking about any kind of social, emotional learning in math books is a way to t indoctrinate children with radical perspectives yeah. on life. To, <laughs> to soften them up for, uh, for then uh, infusing critical race theory yeah. or, or yeah. social and emotional stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's just the latest facet of the insanity of the kind of cultural war that's going on now that, again, is, is making it difficult to be a teacher because you're worried you're going to get fired the next minute for the, for the textbook or the work project that you put students on. It's making it very hard to be administrators. We've got massive uh, retirement rates for school superintendents, you know, approaching 25 percent nationally, people who are wow. stepping down. Uh, and it's making school board meetings a mess in a lot of places. We don't have as much of it here, but, but it's but, but By the way, this is not abstract. They're, this they're is Ron DeSantis yes, strikes in again in Florida. Yeah. Rejecting dozens of these math textbooks, and there was a New York Times uh, piece that looked at the textbooks, and, I, I mean, to me, they looked pretty harmless Yeah, well, stuff. There, there's nothing there. there th you know, for, for a number of years, schools have tried to think more holistically about young people, which, of course, they have to be done. It has to be done. It, it, school isn't just a transfer of knowledge. You, you lift a the cap of a kid's skull and you pour in knowledge and skill. It, you know, you're dealing with human beings and relationships are at the core of that and how people, you know, whether they come to school to deal with the attendance rate question you, you raised before is critically important. Lots of kids, particularly kids who have challenges of, of uh, income or, or housing or food security and so forth, don't come to school in the first place. Well, they're not there. They're not going to derive benefit from it. So there, there are just so many things going on in the lives of children that need to be taken into account here. But the thing that I wonder about is because textbook companies are not going to like the fact that their hundreds and thousands of books are rejected, so they're going to start making textbooks sure. they are. in a way to please Florida and Georgia and Alabama and wherever other places decide that... Lowest common denominator. Yeah. Well, and, I'm, and this is part of the whole uh, thing now, that people are screaming about these kinds of things. Does that mean those of us who are advocates for equity or advocates for any number of these causes... Um, cower to those um, sensitivities or um, uh, do we sort of uh, re-up our commitment and articulate more clearly the argument in favor of um, e taking into account our history as a nation or dealing with the kind of feelings and circumstances that are part of children's lives, of helping children develop the kinds of collaborative skills that enable them to come together and work together effectively to communicate with one another, things of this nature. I mean, it's time to stand up now. Yeah, but it's time to stand up. But, uh, you know, I don't mean to just echo Marjorie with her Fox News effect thing. How many gubernatorial candidates have run in part on making sure the critical race theory, which they probably couldn't even define if their life was in line, be banned from their schools when critical race theory isn't being taught. And it, people are, let me be kind if I can, people are so stupid and so <laughs> uninformed. And I'm serious, in so many settings, and by whatever pablum they are fed by yeah. leaders, this is a really uphill battle on this. these kinds of censorship things. Well, I mean, it's moved away from the rational to the irrational. So this, this becomes a, a situation in which leaders of one cultural tribe can announce pretty much any uh, notion of reality that they dream up and sell it, and they'll get automatic subscription by, uh, uh, by followers, irrespective of all the arguments that you could raise rationally against it. Before you leave, can I put you on the spot on an important moment at Harvard? I assume everybody in this audience, both here and at home or in their cars, has read reports on what I consider to be this terrific 
several year study commissioned by the president, Lawrence Bacow, into the connections to slavery. And there's no blinking in this report. If you haven't read the summaries, they talk about presidents, I think it was four presidents owning slaves, right. how many of the donors at the beginning of the 19th century, I think it was, huge percentage of their money came from slaves, on and on and on like this. Uh, I'm going to raise an issue with you that is unfair, so let me say this in advance. For years, my position on, on this show is the single most important bully pulpit in America is the Harvard presidency. Try getting a president of Harvard to go sell his or her good works outside the ivy-covered walls of Harvard University. It is just un... But they have done in other words, Lawrence Bacco won't go on your show. What you? other show has he gone on, I don't, Marjorie? I don't know. And what <laughs> show did Drew Faust Gilpin go on? <laughs> and, you know, in all serious, I, I, I know you can't yeah, answer right. this question. <laughs> when something this important is done by arguably the most important university in the world, I think what's incumbent on the leadership of your place is to market it to the world rather than doing a video and an open letter to the faculty. Do you want to respond to that? Well, I'm glad you prefaced it with it was an unfair question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> not the first time, but I'm ready for it. Um, I, you know, I, it's not a conflict of interest for me. I'm, I'm a faculty member at Harvard, and, and I'm proud of what the university did in standing up to this. I think, I think it's great. It, I think it's a really a substantial first step forward. Were I in a leadership position, I'd be cautious right now about making statements because this is really the beginning. This is a launch of an effort to look into this with $100 million behind it and do something about it. Uh, it's a very tough set of issues. There are going to be a lot of people coming forward with a lot of different opinions on how this ought to be handled. And if you're going to put in place a process that includes widespread participation, I, as the leader of the process, probably shouldn't be getting pinned down about where I want it to go or what's in play or what isn't in play. So I, I respect their need to be somewhat cautious at the outset. Well, of this I would process. just argue with you. I understand that, and I think that's one of the reasons they're they're reticent now. However, there are many stages of education that have to happen to the public. Last night with Lee Pelton, head of the Boston Foundation I had on, and a woman by the name of Robin Simmons, who is the head of the first government-funded reparations program in the United States. It's in Evanston, Illinois, funded out of actually cannabis tax revenue money, $10 million. And their first reparations project is $25,000 into new home ownership or repairing your home and that sort of thing. And the thing we were talking about is step one is educating the public about the history uh, uh, that our country has, which I think Harvard has done with this report. Step two, I think, before you even get to the implementation phase, which the wonderful Martha Minow, former head of the law school, yep. was going to be leading at Harvard, is, is explaining, why should I, why should I, this is not the same at a private university, why should I as a taxpayer be funding anything in the form of, um, uh, 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 of uh, atoning for what happened long before I was on this planet? And then you get to what the repair looks like. The point is, there's a whole process, is what I'm trying to say, Paul, and I think people like leaders at Harvard get help educate the public as to why this is an issue that the American public does have to get focused on and support. Well, I think I think they're putting it out there, and I, I, again, I, as you said, it's a first step. I think it that's is a, first a good step. thing. Yeah, huge first I, step. I'll, I'll argue that the second step, I'm going to nominate you to be on the Harvard Communications Committee. Let me tell you something. Goes. If they call, <laughs> if I'm free, I'm there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Paul, <laughs> it's great to see you. Thanks so much. And by Thank the way, the report, much, everybody should read it and read the summaries of the report. No, it is really, no question. It's very huge powerful and document. really important. Good yeah. to see you, Paul. Good Thank to you. be with you. Thank you very much, Paul. Paul Rapp was the former Secretary of Education and Professor at Harvard University. Graduate School of Education, where he also runs the Education Redesign Lab. His latest book, co-authored with Lynn Sachs, is Collaborative Action for Equity and Opportunity, a Practical Guide for School and Community Leaders. Thanks again to Paul. Up next. Why don't you describe what's behind me that uh, uh, people are going to be treated to in 20 well, minutes? I'm really excited about this. The people from the Handel and Haydn Society are here with That's all their great. instruments, and they're going to be playing in just a few minutes. This is quite exciting, quite exciting. But first, we're going to talk to our media maven, Sue O'Connell. Uh, she is next. She's going to answer the question, what do you do with a frozen banana? <laughs> Sue O'Connell Nicely put, Marjorie. Is next. You're listening to 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio, broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library.
was it. <laughs> that was my school shooting up. <laughs> is that that's not all you really have to do during the break, is it? Is it? Oh, so you're you're set for whatever sound check? Oh, great. These are professional. Sorry, I was, I, I was kidding. I thought you needed more. Excellent. Okay. Should we and online at gbhnews.org. Our programs are made possible thanks to you and the Office of the Massachusetts State Treasurer. The Unclaimed Property Division is holding unclaimed funds for the citizens and businesses of the Commonwealth. You can see if you have unclaimed money at findmassmoney.com. And Celebrity Series, presenting British cellist Sheku Kenamason with his sister, pianist Isida Kenamason. The acclaimed pair returns to Boston May 7th at Symphony Hall. CelebritySeries.org. Trusted. Local. News. This is 89.7 WGBH. WGBH HD1 Boston. Online at GBHnews.org. Boston's local NPR. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Margregan, live at the Boston Public Library, as we are every Tuesday and Friday. We are streaming on youtube.com slash gbhnews, but if you're in the neighborhood, I would suggest you're 20 minutes away from a huge treat, and I would get over here. So here to answer Marjorie's question, what do you do with a frozen <laughs> banana, and to take on other social norms and abnormalities, including, speaking of, Donald Trump and his obsession with, quote, hard fruit, is media maven Sue O'Connell, who's the co-publisher of Bay Windows and South End News. She's a contributor to Current on NBC, LX, and NECN, and she always leads her own applause. That's Welcome, right. Sue O'Connell. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank job. Thank you very much. <laughs> as Jim said, we do have a lot of fruit stories to get to. I know, so before fruity, we get to the fruit I'm stories, I'm not going to take it as a gay thing. That you have a lot of fruity things. <laughs> okay. I said that. Nicely okay. Yeah. Uh, but before we get to those, uh, a serious story. Uh, there is a crackdown all across the country on uh, abortion rights. Oklahoma legislature has just proved, I guess they don't want any more women from Texas coming over to Oklahoma yeah. anymore because Texas already bans abortions at six weeks. Now they've done that in Oklahoma. This is becoming a trend. Yeah, you know, I, I am loath to predict what the Supreme Court is ever going to do. I don't think I've, I've ever really made a prediction because, as you know, it's hard to do. But I think I feel uh, uh, tragically certain that they are going to rule in favor of the Mississippi law which will be in front of them in June, which will just about automatically allow some 20 states to immediately sort of de facto outlaw abortion by passing these prohibitive um, uh, bans, which basically make it almost impossible for you to know that you're pregnant uh, and impossible to take action, impossible to get an appointment, impossible to you know have the money to get there. Uh, so although it's not like a straight ahead ban, it's a ban because you can't get an abortion. And I'm afraid that these states, these 20 states, uh, and of course Oklahoma is one of them, are going to start rolling that out right now. And I think we're going to wake up in an America in August where almost half of our states, uh, it's impossible for a woman to get an abortion. And, you know, I, 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 I don't know why we're not talking, and I mean all of us, not just media or, or folks at home, why we're not talking more about this when it comes to the midterm elections, right? Because there's this, this point of view on midterm elections that when you have the incumbent president, regardless of the party they're in, they're going to lose the midterm elections. But I'm wondering if this is going to be a wake-up call uh, for progressives, for Democrats, and the majority of Americans who support Roe v. Wade. Right. If this is going to actually turn out 
um, to be terrible on one hand, but allow the Democrats to move Well, forward. we asked that very question to Chuck Todd of Meet the Press yesterday when he's with us. And, uh, what did he say? And, well, he basically said it's the I word, it's inflation. Yeah. Uh, June 9th in prime time, the January 6th committee hearings are going to start mm -hmm. on live television. Uh, Jamie Raskin, who I have great respect for, Congressman, yep. uh, says we're going to blow the roof off the House. I assume as bad as what we've learned so far is they're smart enough to have kept things in reserve. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to change one vote in this country. If you love Trump and his party. I do. You're, well, I do. And number two, well, because number be two. Okay, but you know why? Because what are the numbers? I think one in three women have had abortions, or one in four no, yeah, women I, have had abortions. Well, that's that's the second. I'm, the first issue is January sixth. The second issue is abortion. What would you suggest, Marjorie? Other than hard numbers that you just mentioned about the percentage of women mm -hmm. in this country having an abortion, what in response to this Texas law would cause you to suggest there's about to be a sea change? In, uh, in public opinion about Because I think a lot of women in states in that are banning abortion are going to find out that they're going to lose their, the, the politicians are going to lose their seats. We have had this law since 1973. You know, we're taking away something that, that the majority of women in America have grown up with. What's happening in all the states where they have already taken away those rights, well, Texas, they're Oklahoma, going across Mississippi. the border to Oklahoma, and they're, they're... No, but I meant in terms of their... The, the polls, what kind of shift are they showing? I don't think people think it's real. No, I, Until I agree. Until it happens, I mean, okay. There are a number so. of young adults in my life um, who are now suddenly walking up to me saying, oh, my God, this is like The Handmaid's Tale. They weren't kidding. This is yeah. like – and Maybe the other right. part of it, too, is I, I think right. if the Democrats get smart enough to start messaging what it was like – uh, in the 60s and 70s, that the only people who are going to be able to get abortions are rich people. Mm -hmm. the, only the only people who are going to be able to get abortions are the mistresses of impo important and powerful yeah. men. And that's really what's going to happen. And I think I actually am somewhat optimistic it's going to drive people to the polls, especially when, you know, if you look at it as a victory for conservatives, they're less likely to go to the polls once you have a victory, right? So the only thing that, that may taper it somewhat is because I think what's going to happen is everybody's going to be getting pills. They're going to be doing right. medical abortion, right. so they'll be able to do this in the privacy of their own home. So it's not going to be... And look, at abortion numbers are the lowest they've ever been de facto. I mean, we are successfully able to plan... Well, Families. because we have fewer unwanted pregnancies, we have fewer abortions than we've ever had. Uh, so we should be celebrating the, the the job that we've done in decreasing abortion by continuing. And what who we're gets doing. a lot of the credit for that? Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. which a lot of conservatives want to shut you know, down as well. Before we leave this topic, the person who's de facto leading the charge to outlaw abortion is the former president of the United States. And I will tell a story we've told before. That would be Donald Trump. When Donald Trump was a candidate in New Hampshire, uh, we had him on, and I believe we were the first people to ever ask him if he had a litmus test for Supreme Court justices. And he said, I have two litmus tests. They have to be bright, and they have to be, as he called it, pro-life. Mm -hmm. We were stacked up radio shows in a row. The next radio host was listening to our show, heard that he answered that, uh, that uh, judges to the Supreme Court nominees had to be pro-life, so the next host after us, I don't know where it was in the country, said, I just heard you say on a radio station, there's a litmus test for Supreme Court justices. They need to be pro-life. Can you give me an example of a judge, for example, who you'd nominate who is pro-life? And he immediately said, yes, I can. My sister is on the federal appellate mm -hmm. court. I'd nominate her. Now, what's wrong with that, Marjorie? She's pro-choice. She's pro-choice. Pro yes. And <laughs> Donald <laughs> Trump either didn't know it or chose <coughs> not to, whatever. Speaking of Donald Trump, one of the great lines from Donald Trump, it really clarified a lot of things, is when he said, tomatoes are bad, <laughs> some fruit is a lot worse. And the reason he said that is he was explaining these comments that he made on the campaign trail in Iowa in 2016, telling people to attack a would-be tomato thrower in the audience if they see them. And if they did attack that tomato thrower, he would pay their legal fees. Here's Trump. So I got a little notice in case you see the security guys, we have wonderful security guys, they said, Mr. Trump, there may be somebody with tomatoes in the audience. So if you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them, would you? Seriously. Okay? Just knock the hell. I promise you, I will pay for the legal fees. I promise. I promise. Apparently, apparently it's more president. It won't be so much because the courts agree with us, too. What's going on in this country? No, the courts agree that yeah, fruit yeah. is dangerous. Sorry I interrupted him. But he, apparently he was really concerned about being killed 
by a flying pineapple yeah. or va very dangerous fruit. He went on and on and on about mm -hmm. which fruits were more dangerous than yeah. others and uh, how, you know, the, the pineapples particularly, I suppose, because they're big and they're very heavy. Very, very big fruits. Yeah, they're very, very, very big, big and fruits. heavy, yeah. Very big, big around the world. So here's, here's my problem. Okay, first, you know, obviously Trump thinks all the world is a vaudeville stage, <laughs> right? <laughs> he's you know, he's going to go out there and they're going to pelt tomatoes at him. The problem is, did you know what happened this week in France? I do not. Do you know who was pelted with tomatoes? Marine Le Pen? Macron. He was the he winner? Was. They, had to, they had to put umbrellas over him to protect him from tomatoes being thrown. You know those are dangerous fruit. They're very dangerous fruit. So I don't think that Trump was going to get killed by a tomato or tomato, depending <laughs> on how you look at it. I do think it would be hurtful if you got hit in the head with a pineapple, pineapple. especially a canned pineapple. That's could a very be tough. Really very tough. I mean, very if it was tough. still in the can, very tough. especially. Just take yeah. it right out. It's a very so, good point. Um, you know, I, I, I'm empathetic to mm -hmm. his concern for his safety and that you could indeed be pelted with fruit. Um, I don't think that the answer to it is to, you know, grab people and beat them up and tell other people that you will pay. I mean, this is the violent, chaotic, crazy world that lives in Trump's world. And I don't even know which lawsuit this was that or <laughs> which court case this was. But that the, the Saturday Night Live uh, uh, player who does Trump has him so perfectly He's now, I, I can't help but hear how Trump would talk about Speaking this. Of this is a case. lawsuit filed by a group of protesters, right? Yeah. That, um, from that rally. Yeah. From the rally. By the way, the one, one, you know, one thing we haven't mentioned today that's very significant, you just touched upon, is today is the expiration of the Manhattan grand jury that yep. most people thought was going to indict Donald Trump for artificially inflating his worth to get loans, mm -hmm. artificially reducing his wealth when it came to paying taxes. And as everybody knows, the newly elected DA, Alvin Bragg there, decided that uh, there was no there there. The two lead prosecutors quit a few months ago, and today the grand jury expires, so there will be no indictment. We're talking to Sue O'Connell. Okay, this is my favorite story of the, <coughs> the day. It was on the front page of the Globe today about MIT's Banana Lounge, <laughs> where they have this room that's filled with bananas. Kids can go in there and hang out and eat bananas for free. They can also have coffee and tea and stuff like that. But because it's MIT, they have studied this thing to a fairly well. They, they love their data. Yeah, they figured out the best way to get 800 pounds of bananas from the place where they buy them back to, back to Cambridge. They figured out how many bananas they actually use used all the time, apparently, uh, the day shipment, 500,000 bananas uh, it, it is added up to over the time over they've been, years, yeah, so, yeah. Over the time they've been doing this. Yeah. They have a banana log that guides the operation. Uh, they want to make sure that they don't throw anything out. They have, uh, they freeze their bananas. Mm -hmm. And in answer to the question, what you do with a frozen banana, of course. Let's not answer what you do with a frozen banana. You put it in your smoothie. That's oh, right. Or, or banana, okay, bread. banana bread. Or banana bread. Banana That's bread. right. Okay. But isn't this kind of great? All these, all these M I M MIT math and science geniuses are hanging out, eating bananas, and drinking coffee. So this is so emblematic of MIT. I think right? it is. And mostly because if you said that there was a banana lounge at, like, Emerson, where I went to school, it would have a completely different <laughs> connotation, right? It would not be this, like, wholesome place to hang out and share. And But I, I think that it is so innovative in, um, you know, just giving students and individuals and colleagues a place to hang out around a funky but funny thing that we all have in our kitchens, right? And it's easy. It's a fruit you can eat, yep. peel. If you throw it at Donald Trump, it's not going to really do a lot of damage. No, case, unless he slips on it while he's exactly. walking on the peel. That might be something that Trump should be. I just think it's a great way they've built all of this culture around around this banana lounge. Why do you care so much about the banana lounge, Marjorie? <laughs> You've been you got here this morning. I'm serious, early. All you talked about till showtime. <laughs> and this was, was a late-breaking addition really? to me. Really? Because today. I think I, I think a lot of us have, you know, uh, important relationships with with bananas. You know, I have a <laughs> okay. I brought my I brought my <laughs> peanut butter banana sandwich which today, he showed me. which yeah. I eat on a regular okay. basis. Yeah. I love bananas. Fine. I did not learn until late in life that you could in fact freeze bananas. So the problem of the bananas yep. getting overripe, you just peel them, you put mm. them in the freezer, you can put them in smoothies, you can just eat yep. them plain, yep. like they taste kind of like banana ice cream. Mm -hmm. I mean, babies love mm. bananas. How many people are giving babies All their first points. thing? Mashed bananas, yeah, kind yeah. of the first thing. So they're kind okay. of, plus they're full of <laughs> potassium. Okay, and and I love the fact that they're going through 250,000 bananas per yes. semester over there. And MIT is at, just celebrating MIT, the banana. That's I right. feel a commencement speech coming up from you. Don't you think? I do. I think, I mean, what I think is she's going to deliver the commencement speech What is MIT? America's favorite fruit? 
Um, I would say the apple, actually. The I don't think so. I would say the no, apple. No, I, I don't think yeah, so. I think and anyway, there's too many varieties of apples because you can be very particular about your apples. <laughs> Cortland. It's a Macintosh, pink apple. You know yeah. tomatoes are fruit. You know that, correct? Uh, I always thought it was a vegetable, but no, it's uh, actually I, fruit. I, now it's I know it's, it's a fruit. Are we I done with this? Uh, do you have anything to say? I Jim? had nothing to say <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough been added. You know, I, I would like to say you oh ate some of my like Peter, Peter butter banana sandwich. What did you have to say well, about it? Well, because I wanted to get into the theme of <laughs> the this theme particular of the segment. <laughs> Actually, it's it delicious. was quite delicious. Delicious. Yes. We're done with the banana. So tomorrow night is the White House Press Correspondents' Dinner, which is called the Nerd Prom. First of all, has anybody gone from your place? Does anybody go from your no, place? No, not from here, locally, no. You know, we had our cap. This is a serious comment yeah. about something that wasn't intended to be serious. The fact that a 79-year-old president of the United States who's number two just had COVID, is going to a potential super spreader event yeah. with 2,500 people to celebrate themselves is really... Well, he went to Madeleine Albright's um, funeral service last week. He also went to another service of someone who had passed away that had been held off. Who's, I forget who it is. He has been going out. He's going to be masked, I understand, so at I the heard, event yeah. uh, tomorrow night. Trevor Noah, who's a genius, is yeah. going to be uh, hosting. You know, I hate this event. I hate this event on so many levels. I like the idea of it. I mean, I think it's, you know, there's nothing we love more in media than hanging out with each other and making fun of each other and, you know, rubbing elbows with the, the powerful. But the, the comic is always set up to fail. He probably won't, Trevor Noah. I actually have some confidence that he's going to be able to thread the needle. Everybody else ends up insulting people or getting banned, and it's just a, it's, it's a mess. I feel like... You know, the joke at Trump's expense is what ended up having That's him what people say. run for office. Um, and, and having these gatherings, I mean, I, you know, I listen to you guys every day, and I'm in the same sort of spot about where are we vis-a-vis -vis going out and being public. I'm okay being here. I haven't been wearing a mask. I'm as vaxxed as I can be. Tomorrow night I'm going to Stars on Ice at the, uh, uh, at the um, BU arena. I'll be masked there. Really? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just don't know if I want our president of that age out in that ar arena with that many people because you just don't, you don't know. Marjorie is too shy to ask this question. Before we play some historic sound, by the way, the best comedian that's ever been at the White House Correspondents' Dinner is Barack Obama, who right. was brilliant. Putting that aside for a second, Marjorie is too shy to ask, will there be a banana <laughs> on the plate of each of the 2,500 attendees? Yes. Okay. That's there a yes okay. or no a question. Banana cream pie? I mean, really. really. Is I there I a mean, banana really pie? is exactly I right. Think okay. banana cream pie? I think there's going to be a, a monthly delivery from uh, Harry and okay. David of bananas Okay, here is a compilation of White House correspondent jokes through the years. First, you hear Michelle Wolf. if you didn't hear this, oh, in 2018, where she eviscerates Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who was then the uh, president's press secretary, and I think is on the verge of becoming the governor of Arkansas, I think. Then Obama and his anger translator, uh, Keegan-Michael Key, which was also right. That's 2015. And finally, Colbert in 2006. I actually really like Sarah. I think she's very resourceful. Like, she burns fat, and then she uses that ash to create a perfect smoky eye. <laughs> like, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's lies. <laughs> the nonstop focus on billionaire donors creates real problems for our democracy. And that's why we run it for a time. No, 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 we're not. We're not? No. Who the hell said that? <laughs> now, I know there's some polls out there saying that, that this man has a 32% approval rating. But guys like us, we don't, we don't pay attention to the polls. We know that, that polls are just a collection of statistics that reflect what people are thinking in reality. <laughs> and reality has a well-known liberal bias. Yeah, it's almost... I can't think of a great night recently at the correspondence dinner. Can you? Obama was brilliant. His timing yeah. was brilliant. He really is like he could do stand up. But it also really gets that that mushiness of of journalists with elected officials. That's the part that I you know I know it's a charity. It raises money for something that always kind of gets mi lost in the in the mix. But you know there's this chumminess that kind of happens. Well, there's that also makes me there was that weird moment when George W. Bush was looking for the weapons of mass destruction underneath the couches yeah, that was really on the stage. And yeah. obviously there had been all these deaths. Yeah, yeah. It, it was not something to really make a joke about. Yeah, not yet. Yeah. Too soon. Too soon, as yeah. we say, around my house all so the time. So before you go, you're going to what on ice? I'm going to Stars on Ice, yeah. which uh, has uh, some Olympic skaters who are going to be doing their really? Olympic skating. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. I, I, It's one of those funny things. You know, I'm 60, 
And I'm starting to think about the things that I've wanted to do in life that I haven't done. And I've always wanted to go to this. You have? <laughs> and I suddenly <laughs> was like, I think I can just, I, I could walk to it. I don't know why it's such yeah. a big thing. Yeah, so we're going to so do it's that. It's like a bucket list thing? Stars I wouldn't get that carried away. It's just that I'm, I'm like, you know, we, I'm trying to do something cultural, <laughs> quotes, uh, every month. I'm going to oh. try and go. I haven't really been to the BSO. I haven't been to Symphony Hall in decades. So I'm going to try and do that. How about Handel and Haydn yeah, this week? Yeah, because right? I know. Yeah. This is very exciting. I'll it be at Stars exciting. on Ice. So <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> I'm oh so highbrow. I'm way really up there highbrow. <laughs> Cultural events from once ago. Sue O'Connell, it's great to see you as Thank always. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Sue O'Connell is co-publisher of Bay Windows and the South End News. She is. And a contributor to Current on NBC, LX, and NECN. Thank you very much, Sue O'Connell. And then, as previewed, up next is a special performance by members of the Handel and Haydn Society and an interview with the organization's leader, Harry Christopher's, before his swan song performance this weekend. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH, live from the Boston Public Library. Former President Donald Trump lost his chance to win over the public. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy. She is Marjorie. And I have to say, I'm actually quite excited. We are live at the Boston Public Library, and we are streaming, particularly important right now if you're not here, on youtube.com slash gbhnews. We're joined by Harry Christopher, the longtime legendary artistic director of the Handel and Haydn Society. Performances this weekend, April 29th and May 1st, will be his final performances with the organization. He'll explain why in a couple of minutes. And wonderfully for us and you, he is joined by, I believe, a septet, but a number of his players who are going to treat us to a couple of selections in a few minutes. Harry, it's wonderful to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Good to be here. Okay, well, we're going to find out all about Handel and Haydn Society and your departure and how long you've been there and what you're doing, but we're so excited. We thought we would start with some music. Is that okay? What are we going to hear, Harry? Seems good to me. We're going to play some Bach, aren't we? Boy, that's a hell of an introduction. You're yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, orchestral suite number two is what I've gotten written down here. I think that's it. Correct? Here it is. Okay, here it is. <laughs> Thank you. 
Bad thing is <laughs> Harry Christopher, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for bringing your colleagues along. Do you want to introduce your musicians so everyone oh, will know they're, who's they're here so with us? They're so special here. I mean, we have Emmy, who's been on the flute here, who's just dancing away there. It's wonderful. <laughs> Aislinn. <laughs> Aislinn, our leader, concertmaster. Ian, my old friend from Britain. He's another Brit <laughs> on the harpsichord there. Guy on the cello. Heather here on the double bass, the violone, as we call it. Stephen here on the viola. And Abby here on the other violin. You are great. Just so, beautiful. So tell people who may not know, what is the Handel and Haydn Society? Especially since it's such a new organization. They may not Been be around. familiar with yeah. it. Eric. You're dead right. Now, this is the oldest still performing arts organization in America. And I would hasten to add, it's probably the second oldest in the world. And for you guys, a new country, to be the oldest thing. I think the Le Leipzig Gewandhaus is probably the oldest right? orchestra. Yeah. Was it 200 years? So 1815. 1815. So we're over 1815. That's the orchestra wow. that Andres Nelson's, when he's not playing down the street, is conducting, <laughs> is it not? I believe You're it is. Right yes, it is. That You're is exactly right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and it's Baroque. Music? What kind of music? Yeah, well, we play on period instruments. So all these people here are playing on uh, on old instruments, either originals or replicas. Of yeah, because the flute does not look like the flute you see in modern right. day. No, it's a wooden. It's, yeah, it's stuff. a wooden it's, flute. And it's, it's a gorgeous. And the lovely thing about the music they've been playing, the Bach, it, it, it dances. It feels new, doesn't it? It feels modern. Yes, And yes. I think one of the things we, we, what we like to do, we like to think we do, is that we make this old music, you know, 400, 500 years old, make it sound new and alive. I think that's why it's so exciting for performers to, uh, to play it and for listeners to, to come and hear it's it. It's beautiful. And by the way, other than maybe Symphony Hall, a library, talk about a perfect setting in my estimation for your wonderful colleagues. This is it. You know, the one, uh, uh, we were talking to the harpsichord tuner, a wonderful woman, <laughs> earlier this morning. My understanding is this harpsichord was made in Medford, is that, is it's that true? It's made now here, isn't it? I mean, Ian knows so much about it, but actually we have fantastic harpsichord makers here in this area. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It is such a beautiful inside is instrument. It's painted. Oh, yeah, that, that, I, I that, figured it yeah. was 500 years old. What do I know? I, but it's not. That's the whole beauty of these instruments. They are, they're works of art. So, Harry, Absolutely. 13 years, the endowment has exploded. Everything good that could happen with Handel and Haydn has happened in the last 13 years. We read a ton about your departure this morning, which will happen at the end of this performance on Sunday. Why are you leaving? I don't still, and I really, I don't quite get this. Well, what is the deal? Uh, well, look, I live in England. I have my own group in England called The Sixteen. The Sixteen, we yeah. were listening We've this heard morning. them. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, I've done 13 years here, and it's, it's been absolutely fantastic. I've, I've, it's been, every moment's been wonderful. And I just feel this is the right moment to hand on somebody else. We, we, we've done so much. We've progressed a lot. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I feel really confident I'm leaving the organization in a really good place. No one's kicking you out the door. Is that no the way. bottom no, line? No, they made me this lovely uh, conductor laureate. I know That's that. pretty nice, isn't it's it? Really is it? I don't know if you're too humble to mention. Can you talk about some of the growth in the organization in the 13 years you have been the artistic director? Well, I mean, when I arrived, uh, you know, Handel, why it's called Handel and Haydn is Handel is the old, Haydn's, Haydn was the new. That was when it was formed. And I wanted to concentrate very much on those areas of Baroque and uh, uh, classical music and really adopt a style. When Aizen came as a uh, concert master, we had a real sort of new resurgence, I think, of, of style and, and the manner in which we play. And the one thing I really wanted to do was that we should communicate with an audience all the time. We should be physical in our, our approach. Uh, and the instruments, instruments are that. You've just seen it. And the singers in the chorus as well, they've got to communicate uh, with the audience. And it sounds simple and it sounds a very basic thing, but there are not many orchestras and choruses across the world that actually do that. What did you do during the pandemic? Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> it was really bad. Uh, I mean, luckily with H&H, &H, we, we did some very interesting streaming. Uh, we made some interesting sort of, we didn't just stream a little concert for people. We, we did a sort of demo things. We, we, we talked about the music and we tried to make it approachable to people. And I suppose the one bonus of the pandemic, one little bonus is that we reached people far and wide who couldn't necessarily, but also people in the Boston area who couldn't, for some reason, be able to get to concerts. I don't think that's a little bonus at all. We've talked to a lot of people from the arts who suffered miserably through these two years. And I think that's a huge bonus. There's so many people that either couldn't afford uh, to go see uh, uh, operations like yours, didn't have physical access to them. It did bring in a whole new audience, I did it not? You're absolutely right, yes, yes. And, we, and, it, and it was a big learning curve for us as performers to actually get used to different technology, 
different ideas. And, uh, How'd you decide what you're going to do in your final week? Is it weird to hear you say it, someone say it's his final weekend? How strange is that? It's a bit odd, isn't it? It is odd. Yes. Is it not? But you know, I'm bowing out on one of the pieces I absolutely adore. Yeah, and describe it to, to us. To me, for, you know, back in, I think, 2015, about the bicentennial time, we did Haydn's Creation uh, in Symphony Hall. And I just feel, felt it was the piece we sort of came of age in. And it, I just love the work. You cannot help but smile through the whole piece. And I mean, to me, that's, I mean, I, I, you know, as you can see, I smile away a lot. You are I, I love life, and uh, the creation is pretty a damn good piece to bow out of. Is the audience, beyond the whole streaming thing and bringing in new people, I gotta say, I'm a, a, a convertee. To the, Marjorie's been into this kind of music forever and tried oh, to no, convert. Oh, no, my mother was a musician. That's only the reason why. Well, mine was too, but my father was, and I didn't, in recent years, I, and I don't think I'm aberrational, it seems, Maybe difficult times bring people to arts and, I mean, they do, don't they? they do. Oh, of course they do, yes. I so mean, it's the whole, you know, music brings, it's fantastic for well-being, uh, mindfulness, all sorts of things. It's a great healer. Uh, it's also a great, uh, um, it's full of joy. It, it, it wants to make people happy. It can soothe their souls. It's spiritual. I don't mean, you name it, it so does. Are you it. nervous about this? We, you're downplaying something that I think is huge. I mean, you're a pretty major figure in this community with an incredibly important uh, organization that you've run. I mean, are you anxious? Or what are you in anticipation no, no, of something? I'm not anxious at all. Well, I what are you? I you're enjoy, something. I can enjoy every single yeah, moment you can, of it. Jim can't imagine this because we, the jaws of life <laughs> exactly, to get us needed out of to here. drag That's us exactly. out of here. So it's a different kind of dynamic. Which is what I'm curious about. Tell us about the the 16th, the, that, um, that choral the 16th. instrumental group, because we heard them this morning, and they're just amazing. Tell us about them. Well, that's my baby. I mean, I formed it in 1979. I was, wow. only, I was only 10 at the time. Of course. Uh, of course. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Of course. That's the gray hairs. <laughs> um, actually, I, I've got a lovely anecdote. But back, uh, back in England once, uh, I was uh, in the Times. I was called the Mick Jagger of early music. You and I, I really like that. Oh, that's, that's cool. pretty good. It's a thumbs up, that's I think you're good. better looking, Harry, <laughs> myself. But, but less wrinkles, maybe. <laughs> Whatever uh, happened to him, that makes sure I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I formed that group in 1979, just after I left university. 16th century music, 16 singers. We couldn't think of a name, so I called it the 16. And now we do uh, rock music, we do modern music, we do have an orchestra as well, so you know the numbers are relevant. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I've recorded a vast amount of music, something like 150 CDs. Yeah. And you're going to stay with them when you go. Oh home. my goodness, mate! Yes, yeah. yes, that's okay. very much. And you're going to do some work with Handel and Haydn, from what I understand, from I, time to time. Yes. I would love to be. Do you? I'm not making the offer. I don't have the authority, <laughs> but I understand. Do we know who your successor is, or no, do you know? Not do yet. you know when you're not telling no, us? No, no, I don't know. I don't. don't. Okay. Do you know? Is it any different in in Great Britain? Um, the classical music scene versus kind of the hip hop and the rock and roll and the folk and all that. I mean, we're all over the place here. I know obviously there's a lot of great rock and roll artists out of Great Britain, but is it different? You think in the United States, classical music is more of a elitist kind of thing, you know what I mean? I think less so in 2022, but yeah. maybe you're right. Yeah, well I think what we've done here at H&H &H is actually bridge that gap. Yeah. Um, and I think, there's and also younger audiences come to it. But cause you know, classical music has, a has had a lot to play um, we, you know, over the years. You know, we've been very much, you know, we wear our wonderful suits at concerts, we're, we're up there, and audiences feel that we're unapproachable. Yeah. But actually, we're approachable, we're just normal people, we're just, we're, and we make fun, and we have great laughs playing music, but we're also incredibly committed to our art, and we have faith in what we do. And I think that's really important. If you know that artists on that stage are, are really up for the concert, and really up for, for communicating with the audience in front of them, then you'll see a big difference. And we at H and H have seen a younger audience come to, to come to Symphony Hall because it's accessible. You can wear you can wear what you like yeah. to Symphony Hall, really. And a lot I of mean, students. I wear I wear the, co the chorus made me some t-shirts, <laughs> five t-shirts they given me of comments that I make. Does so it say on there? Yeah, this one actually. This is just what a simple one. It just says mega. 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 <laughs> That's long good. as it's not mega, then we're uh, then we're okay. If you know what I mean. So what are your uh, colleagues going to play for us uh, here, Harry? Some more Bach. Oh, is that what we're yeah, here? More, you more, what more the orchestral suite number two. It is. By the way, they were terrific. And by the way, c huge congratulations to you on a spectacular career. We hope you're not a stranger. Thank yes. you very much. Here they are again. And one <laughs>
want to get tickets for Harry's last performance of The Creation, they are available online at handelandhaydn.org. And our, uh, well, they played us out already. Are they going to play us out no, again? No, that was it. That was it. Okay. <laughs> that was it. Thank you very Thank much. You that was wonderful. wonderful. Harry, good luck. It's Thank great you to very see much you. Thank you so Thank much. You. you are listening to Thank Boston you. Public Radio 89.7 live from the Boston Public Library. Stay tuned. We're going to open the lines and talk to you about kissing in the metaverse. That's next on 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio, live from the Boston Public Library. Diane Wilkerson went from state senator to prisoner to activist, and now she could be headed back to the state house. I'm Adam Riley. Join me tonight for Talking Politics. We'll dig into that story with Sean Philip Cotter of the Boston Herald and Soraya Wintersmith of GBH News. Plus, legal sports betting nears the finish line on Beacon Hill. All that on Talking Politics tonight at 7 on GBH2 and online at gbhnews.org. Support for GBH comes from you and the Box Center, presenting Celtic Illusion, the modern Irish dance and stage show. You can experience choreography mixed with magical illusion May 7th at the Box Center Schubert Theater. Tickets at boxcenter.org. And Ocean State Job Lot, partnering with customers to provide Ukrainian refugees with medical supplies, health and hygiene products, food, and clothing. Learn more at oceanstatejoblot.com. Well, from the sublime to the ridiculous, Marjorie, <laughs> welcome back to Boston <laughs> Public Radio. We're live from the Boston Public Library, and you can uh, we're streaming on uh, YouTube.com slash GBH News. Well, the future is here. Aside from the wonders of being able to watch a radio show on your computer and watch the Handel and Haydn players, new advancements in virtual reality have made it possible to kiss other people in the virtual reality metaverse, sort of one small kiss for man or woman, but one potential problem for that man or woman. Here's how it works. In addition to that virtual reality headset you've all probably seen, there are now mouthpieces you can buy that'll stimulate, uh, simulate pardon me, the feeling of a person's mouse, mouth, their lips, and yes, their tongue. Yeah. We want to bring you into this conversation because it raises a thousand questions. If you're in a relationship and you kiss someone in the metaverse, are you cheating? <laughs> and could this be the future of romance for the millions of people who are looking for it out there. And by the way, let me just get out of the way right away, Mark. We know there are darker implications to this about people forcing themselves on virtual strangers. We're not going to dive into that part of the conversation today. We do want to know what you think about this brave new world of, let's call it, love and romance, <laughs> or do you just find it a bit creepy? The number is 877-301-8970. As you know now, that's both for calling and texting. You can email us at bbrwgbh.org or tweet us at BOS Public Radio. So I, I think the solution to a lot of people's problems, don't you think? Well, listen, I, you know, I, I think if people are on Match.com or they're on Bumble or Tinder or any of the other things, mm -hmm. and oftentimes things don't work out no, for weeks don't. or months or sometimes years. Mm -hmm. So why not, if you have a device that brings feeling sensation to your mouth, lips, and tongue, Jim, you'd be, you could be making out in your own house while you're so waiting for something to work out <laughs> in, the, in the real world. And the whole idea of, of the virtual world dating is Did you read really about those two guys yes, who met each other? It's really attractive yeah. too. I mean, they 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 spied each other's avatars yep. that looked a little bit like what they look like, yeah. and then they were, were you know communicating uh, in the virtual world. And then they eventually they liked each other and they actually met in person. And they ended in up the getting world. married. They did. So it, it's and and the virtual dating, uh, the virtual world dating allows you really to get a much closer sense of what someone is like than just texting back and forth or emailing Maybe. back and forth on a. Well, you have to eventually meet them in person, but it gives you kind of a good, a good preview. So I don't know. I think this is a, I think this is a wonderful new world. So we want to know if you think it's a wonderful new in world. In that section of it, anyway. Your enthusiasm level is quite 
high. A lot of people are lonely, Jim. How do you feel about this whole, yeah, but a lot of people aren't lonely. That's another issue. Well, if they're not lonely, they won't need this service. Well, but, they may but be if they're not lonely, they may use this service. And that raises the second question. Are you cheating if you engage in a relationship in the virtual world? Why are you making a face like that? I don't, I, I don't, I don't think so. Are you? I think you are. Oh, you are. Okay. Well, I think if you have a simulation of someone, if you'll excuse the expression, tongue in your mouth <laughs> on virtual reality, <laughs> I would say yes, you are probably pretty close. 877-301-897. What was the movie? Was it called Her? She. Or was it she, she or whatever her? It was. was her. Was it was her? It her? It was her. You're right. Her. You're Thank right. you, John But Parker, the guy that was in here. love with his operating system. Yeah. And the operating <laughs> system happened to be who? Oh, Scarlett, Scarlett Johansson. Johansson was well. very, yeah, it was great. He's going off. He's taking a week off, and he's going to some secluded cabin out in the middle of nature, and he's got his computer with him. Exactly. Because that's what he's Well, that's a spend. variation on this theme, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, let me tell you what my truck. He fell in love with the computer. Do you not think there's a point? She this was cheating on him, by the way, remember? I do. Uh, as a ma I remember yeah. quite well. I yep. saw that movie a couple of it's times. outrageous. Now, let me just saw say it a couple of times. I might have seen it so a couple of times. So you can relate to that, Jim. I can relate to that, but let me just say this. Jim has several computers, do not <laughs> just so I'll let you know. <laughs> yes, they're locked. They're password <laughs> protected, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but my, in all seriousness, can you not see us slipping into this kind of relationship to the exclusion that's what gives me creeps about all this okay. stuff by the way it's not the thing itself you know if what? it's an adjunct to real life but this is all going to become a replacement for well, real life well we've done stories before about uh, people that are older that their spouses have died or they never were married okay, or they're so, yeah. in, in, they're in poor health and they, uh, and how it's kind of creepy that they would have these these robot animals to keep them company but you know what I mean, if the choice is something like this and nothing, maybe this is th this is not ideal, but maybe it's the maybe it's the better choice. And plus, if you're a little bit nervous about your kissing techniques, you could practice, Jim, in the virtual world well, and kind of kind of get up to par for when the real thing comes along. You know what I mean? I'd like to see your credit. I would bet Oculus has been on your credit card slip in the last couple of days. Eight seven seven three zero one. 8970 is the phone number. Now, Katie's got a good point. What she says. She says, my advice to all, to all is this. If you haven't smelled him or her, you just don't know you are not in love. Well, that's a pretty yeah, romantic Yeah, that's a pretty thing. I can, I can thing. you smell in the virtual world? I'm not sure. Well, I assume you can eventually. If you can feel someone's tongue in your mouth, which apparently <laughs> you can here, I would assume you can smell them at the appropriate point as well. 877-301-8970 is both, as I say, the texting number. And the phone number, if you would like to give us a call. Don't be shy, by the way. We're not going to track you down kind of thing. Now, in all seriousness, why do you not think that this, if you're in a relationship, why do you not think that engaging in another relationship in VR well, because is, is it's okay? Because not, it's not real, Jim. Yeah. It's not real. Okay. It was. It, it's, it's, so it's if you go to a strip joint, you're not having a relationship. That is that okay? That's well, okay no, too. Well, no, because you're going, you're getting your car, you're driving to the place. I What's mean, that's the a, that's a different kind of. Th I, you're well, going I to another listen, place. I haven't explored virtual reality en enough to really to really know all the ins and outs as it were. But I just don't so think this speak. is the same as having you know be carrying on with the secretary or carrying on with the boss or something like that. And I think the idea of virtual dating is really exciting. Yeah, but I, this is not really about, the thing that it got us connected to the story was not virtual dating. It was, it was the physical feel of the virtual dating. And you know what, in all seriousness, and I don't mean to be overly whatever, mm -hmm. you know what the next step, I assume, is after this sensation. Can you imagine what the next virtual step is? Virtual sex. I would assume yeah. that that is exactly what it is. Yeah, How do you I feel about that? Well, I would say don't knock it till you try it, Jim. You know, you never know. It could be a wonderful experience. Could be a wonderful experience. Okay. Sounds it, like you've been there. By I the have way. not. I have not. I have not. I have noticed there's a there's a, a different, a, a great different style. In what do you call the things, the Oculus that you that that's you buy? One of them. Yeah, that's I one. mean, they're very different. You know, sometimes well, they're, they're different th brands of things. Different yes. brands. I mean, some p some of them are rather ridiculous, and you look kind of funny sitting there with this big thing over your head. But what do people think? Do they think that this is weird? Do they think it's not weird? Do they think this is a good uh, way of dealing with loneliness if you are between relationships or you're older and your spouse is gone or something like that. Or to transition into a relationship. You mentioned those two guys who ultimately met each other in real life and totally hit it off, but their connection was through the so-called metaverse, right? Was that not how it all started? That's right. What happened is that one of them spotted the other one, uh, the new dark-haired bearded avatar with a pink hoodie, 
on this uh, site that he was at, and he could hear him chatting with other avatars, and he was so impressed by his confidence and presence, as this gentleman told the Washington Post. It took him a few days, but he built up the courage to actually speak to him, and when he actually spoke to him, there was an instant connection. Now, the person that was talking here is a physician, so he's obviously a, a very educated guy. The other guy was, he ran some gym or something like that, and after two months of flirting online, they decided to meet in person. They lived in um, Wales, I guess, mm -hmm. or was it Great Britain? Yeah, th I, think th I think one was in Great Wales Britain. and one was in well, London. In any case, uh, yeah, th that's right. And they, they met together, and the attraction was enormous when they met in real life, as it has been online, and now they are getting married in September of 2023. By the way, the text here at 5956 says it's cheating if you're hiding it from your partner. One of our colleagues made a really good point, just wrote us a note. The other person in virtual reality is a real person. So it, it, it is, how is it not crossing a line? I don't know why you're so, you're dismissive of that notion. In any case, 877-301-8970, if you want to give us a buzz or a text about this particular uh, conundrum. Yeah, I think, I think it's an issue of loneliness, that's what I think. I mean, don't we hear that all the time? But I'm talking about people who are not lonely, who just decide, let's call it an adjunct to what you're currently doing. That's where I think it becomes an issue. Do you know, cheating, here is 25-1. Cheating is defined by the individuals in the committed relationship. Every couple has the ability to discuss and choose what their relationship boundaries are. That is Caro, or Carol, I don't know, in Watertown. That's assuming you've had that discussion before you uh, uh, do the VR experience, you know? And then we have another texter who says, virtual kissing sounds a little weird. Technology is gonna destroy us. Is remote, this is your question, Jim. Mm -hmm. Is remote physical contact via a device potentially adulterous? Yes, the texter says, if we're doing it I, right. I, I don't even think it's a close question, and I'm surprised Maybe you haven't spent enough time in the virtual world. Maybe I don't you haven't. 877 It's odd that people are a little tentative here. People are willing to text us but in an odd moment, nobody is willing to call us. That has actually never you know happened need? to us. We, What's we that? need a voice d changer, voice disguiser. Well, you can actually d disguise your voice when you call in and just do that kind of thing. Yeah, when I used to work for Boston Magazine, you always have covers of men on the cover. They might be politicians, they might be sports stars. And um, I mean, I'm sorry, there were always good looking women on the cover mm -hmm. and men never sold well, whether they were sports stars or politicians. Women always sell very well. We had one cover uh, showing a woman getting out of the bed in a hotel, buttoning her blouse, and the man was still in the bed, and it was an issue about adultery. Biggest so. No. Oh, it did? Plummeted, because no one, no was, one, going wanted it in no one was going to buy that and bring that home to their spouse, because they'd be very suspicious about it. So anyway, 877-301-8970 is the number if we get some daring well, callers. Well, we do have daring callers I think callers we have some now. daring callers starting now. You can also text us at that same number, 877-301-8970. Or you can contact us via email at bpr at wgbh.org. Was this in Woody Allen's movie Sleeper? I don't remember uh, that. Today. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. John uh, Parker once again knows. Yeah, Beth says it was. I don't remember that scene in Sleeper, but he was ahead of his time in a whole bunch of well, things. Well, let me tell you, and a whole bunch of unfortunate things, but that's a whole other story. Let's go to Teresa in Boston. You were first on Boston Public Radio. One courageous soul in the crowd. Welcome, Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> I am so excited about this news. Apparently. I am the mother of a deafblind woman, and I am an advocate for deafblind people. Oh. I think, yes, this is, to me, another step toward there being a virtual, tactile sign language available for deafblind people who have to have it signed into their hands. Well, I have to I say, it would never have occurred to me, but I think you're on to something. I, I really, d had you thought about this or explored this before, Teresa, or is this a new encounter with this deal? Well, I have really been trying to find out whether it has moved at all, the, the research, I think at MIT, for training doctors in making incisions uh -huh. virtually, yeah. that that is there, that you know, they can get the feel of it. So I think it's just the will to do it uh, that's missing here. Um, but it would really be a boon. Um, not only could people...
people uh, sign virtually, but a lot of people who sign are not comfortable touching, mm -hmm. um, using tactile sign language. I understand. I understand. Yeah. I, well, I don't understand. <laughs> well, I do. Teresa, we really appreciate your call. Thank you very much for making it. Paul says yes. what I can relate to. <laughs> Paul texts and says, I can't help but picture an old man found dead with his helmet on and a smile on his face. <laughs> That's sort of the, I mean, that is the creepy side of this. Let's go to, Br oh no, we'll get Brunier, we'll get to you in a minute. My apologies. Oh my goodness. Chris on the South Shore, you're next on Boston Public Radio. What's up? How you doing? Good. I just wanted to uh, say, I think it's fantastic. And why is I that? Think, uh, yeah, I, I think it's necessary for human connection, uh, for people that are removed from family. Everybody wants to focus on the sexual aspect of it. Um, but people need to be touched. People need to feel that connection. And for people working in remote locations that have no access to family or people that are in other countries, say somebody over in the Ukraine, to be able to give them a hug, to be able to Boy, touch their face. Good. Boy, that's a great you know, point, Chris. Chris you know, it's humiliating. Look where Marjorie and I went and look where the callers <laughs> are going. This is pathetic. Chris, no. we're really glad you called and the first caller as well. Thanks so much for doing it. So I got, uh, just got this text. Marjorie, you're dead wrong. My husband is engaging in a virtual relationship. He met her through a video game. Now they FaceTime, sext, and chat on the phone behind my back. It is absolutely cheating. How about that? Well, how do you, what do you respond to her? What do you say to her? Well, I mean, I suppose that's a, that's a good point. I was just thinking about the innocent. That's a good point. I suppose I was just thinking of the innocent, you know, virtual kiss, but I guess they took it a few steps further down the line. Uh, someone else says they're waiting to make devices. Oh, I shouldn't read that one. No, you shouldn't. I okay. chose not to. <laughs> Brenier, now it is your turn. You're in Hyde Park. Welcome to the show. It's good to talk to you as always. Hi. Hi, guys. How are you? Excellent. Well, um, I think sometimes technology makes people forget the fundamentals. I mean, what if you were to find letters that your husband or your wife sent to somebody? It would have been cheating. So why is it that suddenly, because it's technological, then we are asking and doubting our uh, our fundamental values. It makes no sense. Of course it's cheating. Brunier, that would be addressed to Marjorie Egan. Marjorie, what do you want to say to Brunier? He is dead spot on. Well, I guess, you know, because I haven't done this, maybe well, I Well, how about I respond to his letter thing? If you found Well, it's letters, yeah, absolutely. What's the that would be terrible. That remember remember the story or the terrible story about Eleanor Roosevelt finding the love letters that Franklin wrote to the love of his life when she was unpacking his bags. Oh, that was absolutely terrible. Yeah, I guess what I'm thinking of is just like a machine kind of encounter, Brunier, which to me is different, but but maybe... Set her straight, Brunier. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. It you is? Know, the tool is a letter, a computer, it doesn't matter. It's the tool. And besides, cheating is anything that you do surreptitiously. Well, that's uh, true. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what it well, is. suppose suppose Bernier, you're married to a terrible kisser and you really don't want to <laughs> kiss them. <laughs> You'd rather yet another do the, excuse. The virtual kind Brunier, of experience. It's great what do you to talk think? to you as always. Oh, I mean, we don't. I thanks. I, do, I divorce her. <laughs> What'd Br you say? He said I divorce her. <laughs> uh, Bernier, thanks for the call. We appreciate it. You know that is a problem. Some people never do learn how to how to kiss. Maybe you could perfect perfect your technique in this virtual reality, you know, Jim. On a serious note, for a second, that guy who called from the South Shore—I forgot what his name—that's a great Chris, point. That is a really really tactile i mean physical well, contact you or at least me. the simulation I was saying the same thing in a less articulate way well you were talking about sex Loneliness. but that's no. a little different from hugging someone when you're miles well, away or he or she is in Ukraine, as he said. Part of the epidemic of loneliness is not being is touched. It's no touch. That's correct. Yeah. Marjorie's trying to weasel out. I of am her trying to weasel out. That's thing. absolutely correct. Liz from Boston. Thank hey you Liz, for calling. What's up? Hi, how are you? Excellent. So as soon as I started to listen to this conversation, and I'm sure you've interviewed Sherry Turkle from MIT before. Many a yes, time. We, we haven't have. seen her in a few years, yes. but yeah, yes, we she's have. great. I yes, I worked for Sherry back in 2000 in my old life before I had kids. And she wrote the book alone together. And mm -hmm. as soon as I heard you talking about it, um, I don't know, a virtual relationship, it's just, uh, you know, I remember a quote from the book, it, it gives the illusion of intimacy and companionship. And the more, technolo more technology is just bringing us further apart as humans. And I just think it's, it's a bad idea. Well, I, I mean, uh, uh, and by the way, you, uh, I haven't seen Sherry in a few years, and tell me if I'm misstating it, but it, I, it, it, seemed it, it wasn't about this as such. It was talking about how one isolates oneself from human contact 
By, ha yes. I by the way, I, for whatever it's worth, Liz, people don't believe this is true, but it is totally true. I have been on television off and on for a little more than 20 years. The only time okay. in 20-plus years where my phone rang on the air out loud was when I was talking to Sherry Turkle about how horrible it was when you don't disconnect from yeah. your phone <laughs> when you're having – and it yeah. was not planned, and it was humiliating. <laughs> Liz, Liz, thanks for the call. Hold on, oh, hold on Liz. So, but I guess, yes. I guess I would argue, and maybe I'm wrong, but that if you are – like I said, I, for whatever reason, uh, unable to be in a relationship, or you've tried and it hasn't worked out, and um, it, it seems like this is better than nothing, isn't it? Um, I I don't think so because I think it just changes the way we connect with people, and there's no practice there in communication or intimacy. So I I don't know. I maybe I'm super. Old-fashioned, but I'm not. Yeah. But I, I don't know. In, the, in this case, that's the very first thing I thought of. I was like, this is a really bad replacement for the real thing. Uh, so. Liz, thank you for the call. By the way, another person responded to you. So Marjorie is totally wrong. This is odd where people disagree with you as opposed to me. The metaverse is avatars, but there's still a human right. being behind the avatars. So if you're conversing or kissing or whatever with your avatar, then you're engaging basically in an online relationship, which is totally cheating. Uh, 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 to your in-person physical relationship, a la Brunier. So end of discussion, is it not? I hadn't thought of that angle. No, you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have not been on the, I have not been in the, in the metaverse, Jim. I don't have any, me. I don't have my Oculus. Marjorie's going to try to weasel out of this. Robert, you have 30 seconds. You're from Worcester. You're the last call. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. The two of you I love. You've saved me over the past six years listening Whoa. to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. I wanted to say that in terms of the context of uh, whatever, immorality yeah. or uh, breaking a relationship, I think if this is in the context of an, a game, avatar game, I don't see it as being very different from an actor and an actress playing a part where physical touch is necessary uh, or an important part of portraying their character. Robert, why don't you stay on the line? I'll give you Marjorie's number after the show. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert, for your call. We appreciate it. We're okay, done. We're, we're done with this. Thank you very much for listening to another edition of Boston Public Radio. Thank you to people that came down to the library. I hope you enjoyed Thank hearing you for the coming. people from we the really Handle and Hyde Society. were absolutely fantastic. Were they fabulous, by They the were way. fabulous. They were fabulous. Uh, you can keep up with us 24-7 by way of our podcast. On Monday, we're going to have our political roundtable. We haven't done that in a while, no, Jim. We haven't. Michael Curry and Jennifer Nassour will be with us, plus our food guy, Corby Kummer, the Reverends Irene Monroe and Emmett Price, and journalist Anad Giridardis. He's uh, a must-takeover of Twitter. He is a brilliant guy. He's going to tell us what billionaires buying everything could mean. On Tuesday, we're going to be back at the Boston Public Library with legendary filmmaker and author John Waters. John I'm very Waters. excited about that. I want to thank our crew, Zoe Matthews, Aidan Conley, Kenzie Farkas, Rebecca Tauber, our engineer, John the Claw Parker, our executive producer, Jamie Bologna, and our on-site engineers today, Colin Cockrell and Sai Patel. Uh, Jim, you're not on TV no, tonight. No, but I want to say, you know, occasionally Adam Riley I encounter at seven, some Adam Riley at Basic yeah, Black seven. at 7.30 yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, Open Studio at Jared but at I, uh, much more impo That's what? really important. Much more importantly, What's you know, important occasionally to someone says, why should I listen to your radio show? Uh -huh. And I think we just answered the question, where else, where else? Do you get Bach and then sex <laughs> in the metaverse? <laughs> right in a row, butted up against no, each other, so to you're speak. You're forgetting a very important part of the show today. What's that? The frozen banana. Frozen banana. Subject. Same that was, thing. That was big as well. That was Marjorie's idea. Okay, I'm versatile. Jim Browdy. Versatile. Have a wonderful weekend. Yeah, you too. I'm Marjorie again. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, thanks for listening to us Thank this you. week. Thank Hope you can tune in again on Monday. And have a great weekend.